everybody and welcome to the 11th running of the Le Mans Classic from the Circuit de la Sarthe. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you for the first of three sessions today and two sessions tomorrow. A little bit of overnight rain, but that's cleared up. We even had a bit of sunshine a moment or two ago. The statistics here are absolutely extraordinary. Over 200 car clubs with eight and a half thousand cars on display. That's before we get to the racing, by the way. You could spend a week here if they were here for a week and not see everything. We're just finishing off some parade laps this morning for uh, some very fortunate drivers who have been out on the circuit. But I guarantee you that you could wander around here and almost at every turn it's here either, well, I've never seen one of those for ages or I've never seen one of those before. Taking us through today and tomorrow alongside me, John Hindorf, Andrew Marriott and Peter Snowden. And we have an absolute cracker of a race to get us underway. It's a 43-minute time certain contest for the endurance racing legends that will kick off our live show. Andrew Marriott on the front row. It somehow seems right that our first racing action, we have a Pescarolo C60 on the pole position. Pescarolo so indelibly linked with the 24 hours, the Vancouver du Dumont on pole position with Emmanuel Collard who drove the car. I see it in period, but I can remember commentating on this car and you probably can too. Yeah, absolutely. What a fantastic grid. We've just been down to the marshalling area and there's a real bubble about all the drivers there. They are saying, John, that this is the best grid there's ever been for the Legend Series. So we're talking about cars that raced only 10, 12 years ago, back to 20 years ago. And what a delight to see on the front row alongside Collard, the Toyota GT1, the fantastic Toyota effort, which failed, of course, way back when in 1999. Built Puncture. like a Grand Prix, like a Grand Prix car. Puncture cost at the race, didn't it? And the in yeah. the last stint, um, I remember seeing that. That was that's one of my favourite. Um, in fact, that might be my favourite Le Mans car. Uh, driving that yeah. one, Peter. Good morning to you, Francois Perrodo, who uh, Emmanuel Collard and Francois very firm friends. They drive together in the World Endurance Championship. Manu Collard's probably driving as, as well now as he ever has done. Francois Perrodo. <laughs> a more than very competent uh, gentleman driver in contemporary racing, but can really show his, uh, show his metal in these classic machines. I would, I would say that uh, Francois Prodo is, is probably, uh, a gentleman driver is probably a little bit of an unfair uh, statement for him. Uh, he's, he's a bit beyond that, isn't he? He's, you say, yeah. consummately capable. Um, just going back to your thing you said this morning about walking through the paddocks on the way in and all those car clubs yeah. and haven't seen one of those or whatever. There were a couple of cars where even I had to go, what is that? Well, yeah. <laughs> it was, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah, I've just a bit about Perodo. You know, he owns a massive company that drills oil all around the world. Apparently, he owns about 50 sports cars, including about 20 Ferraris. He lives in a £20 million castle near Bordeaux when he isn't living in London or his home in Saint-Tropez or his home in Paris. Like he was. It's a super chap, though, and doing a terrific job. But how... Oh, a bit of fettling going on, uh, we see on our TV screen, for those of you who are watching us on the live screen. Um, but fantastic, he's bought this Toyota. It's never raced since period. I don't think it's been seen since period. I don't know the story of how he acquired this this car from Toyota, but it's it's going to be marvellous to see it again. In the first qualifying session, he was fourth. Now he was second last night in a session which stopped and started to get on the front row of the grid. Makes me think, John, that he's, he hasn't had much time in this car and he's getting used to it, and he could be a real threat to Collard. It, it, it's... Uh, changeable conditions it will be drying conditions at the moment it's 19 degrees in the air track temperature is 21 we had that up well into the 30s when the sun was on the track yesterday the humidity is extensive it's actually dropped down to 84 
percent now. It was up at 90 percent earlier on this morning. It was actually drizzling when we came in a couple of hours ago and walked in through the east gate over by. For those of you who know uh, the, the Le Mans 24-hour circuit, we're on the full track. We're on the uh, the full eight and a half miles, and the stadium. Uh, is where we're parked and we walked in through what's called the east gate and immediately got up onto the bugatti circuit the circuit yeah. permanent circuit here and walked down it's where a lot of the car clubs are based loads of gt40s down there then round past the aston martin owners club uh, past the citroen sms uh, and we saw that extraordinary Citroen was about 30 feet long. It was a sort of transporter, was it? It's, most it's, a, it was a, it's a race car transporter. There's yes. another one that was de that is decked out that I used for my very first time here. I think in it was either 2002, the first year, or 2004, the second time that we were here. That was a, a TV, um, a TV and film uh, vehicle. Yeah. Where you could have a camera on it and either sit a car down low and pretend people were driving. Yeah, yeah. It was that kind of thing. And we did the whole Mortis TV yeah. show from the, the back of that car. Not moving around, yeah. I hasten to add. Huge crowds here, gentlemen, which did cause some problems last night yeah. in terms of people getting in and out. But I have to say, we when we arrived here on uh, Thursday and certainly walking around yesterday, uh, it, it, it was akin to a quote-unquote normal 24-hour well, Wednesday or Thursday. Well, I've not seen crowds like this. When before. we walked in at the gate, we saw that sign, sold out. Yeah. You can't get in. I believe there's a few tickets for tomorrow. Um, Peter, I suppose we ought to just describe how this whole two days is going to pan out because we're starting with one of the four, what they call support, support races. races. Not ra and then we go into the system with the Le Mans 24 hours where they, they race three times. Yeah, so each of the plateaus, you've got the six plateaus, as we call them, uh, grids, uh, some phenomenal numbers on those grids, 70, 80 cars in some of them, oh. ranging, of course, across the, the, it's the centenary year of you know, Le Mans itself, of course, this one as well. Uh, so we're celebrating that, but different, different series of, of eras. And then each, each grid has three races, approximately 50 minutes. Don't quote me exactly on that, but approximately 50 yep. minutes. The idea, the principle being they have a race on Saturday, a race at night, and a race on Sunday. And, and you, all the time together. Have, all the time together, have an accumulator. Uh, and basically, so you, you, can do, you can do really well in the first two and then have a DNF in the third, and it affects, affects your aggregate. aggregate. Uh, and, John, the drivers can do it in different ways. You can have only one driver does all three races. We're talking about not about, about what's coming up now, but later. Or you could have one driver does one race, another driver does the next. Or you can change drivers in the middle of the race. And this race and all the races have got pit stops. It, it's the car. Yeah. Basically, the car is being classified. The cars are very much the stars here across the net. The, the idea of being, as, as Andrew and Peter have, have mentioned, you get you, you get an evocation of doing the Le Mans 24 hours. So you're getting uh, a Saturday, either a Saturday afternoon or evening race, Sunday morning or afternoon race, and something in darkness for each of the five grids. Slightly different, as Andrew rightly says, for this first race. Coming up today, uh, we have uh, the Porsche Classic race, another one of the... Uh, invitational races, if you will, which has a million cars in it. I mean, this one has 76. Uh, then there's about a million Porsches, and then we have the Group C race. Now, the Group C, a, a lot of people will wonder why Group C is an invitation, is one of the support races, rather than a plateau on its own. It's because Classic Le Mans, when it was conceived by Patrick Peter uh, in 2002, it did not go that far into, remember that's 21 years ago, yes. so it did not go that far into Le Mans history and it was decided that particularly with the speed of those cars, it, should, it was a good idea to keep them completely separate, they have developed that down through the last 20 years to be a very good series in its own, so that is somewhere near 20 minutes before midday local time, we're on Central European summer time, one hour ahead of British summer time I know that there are people joining us all over the world uh, from staying up late in California uh, to getting up early if you are in Australia and New Zealand if you want to get in touch with us at RSL underscore studio on Twitter and we'd be delighted to hear from you. I know that Blur Fiend is up bright and early in uh, in Florida, 
and he'd be going bonkers about all the Porsches. We, we've had two display laps with must, which must have had a couple of hundred cars in them each, yeah. which, which were all Porsches, and then we've had a couple of mixed ones as well. I, I reckon we've had the sharp end of six or 700 cars on this track already this morning. I'm sure we have, John. You said the cars are the stars, but there are some star drivers there. There are. Just coming up in this race, quite way down the field, Four times winner, Yannick Dalmas, one of the quiet men of Le Mans. Of course, won in the McLaren in 1996, won in Peugeot 92 and 93. He was second, won again in 94 in the Dower Porsche 962. Just a phenomenal driver, always been a quiet man, but a very safe pair of hands. So 48 Grand Prix starts as well. But I've seen Derek Bell here. I don't think Derek is driving, he's in the parade. We've seen Brian uh, Redman here as well, and lots and lots of big names, all the big French names. So stand by for action as we're about to get things underway for the 11th edition of the Le Mans Classic, live from the Circuit de la Sarthe 2023. are rolling on their warm-up lap and in behind the safety car, pace car, I suppose you would call it at the moment, and on the front row, Pescarola C60, Manu Collard leads them out in that classic Le, Th Le Sartre and PlayStation coloured car, all the top sports cars. If you're new to sports cars, you'll be going, what is that? We used to have open-top sports cars 20 years ago. Alongside him, the man with whom he's been driving most recently, Francois Perodo, a very popular man in the WEC paddock in the Toyota GT1, one of the prettiest cars uh, on in the Le Mans history. Then it is the Maserati MC12 GT1 from 2005, that's a Paul Sitter in class, all the top three actually, Paul Sitter's in the subclasses, let's not worry about that right now. Uh, Sean Lynch behind the wheel of the number seven, Bentley Speed 8 from 2003, sister car to the winning car, of course, in 2003. Yeah, they, they didn't race at them all that year, it was a spare, and they, I think it won, won uh, Sebring, though, that particular chassis. Then behind them, uh, it's another beautiful car, the Dallara SP1, uh, for the uh, 58 car and Darren Turner in the Aston Martin DBR9 is what the best of the G GT cars if you will Actually, that's only showing that's showing only in oh that's in the same class as the Maserati um, which Nick Damon will be very happy about they'll form up and this will be a rolling start rolling start we're going to have a mandatory pit stop in the middle of it it will be one minute 30 seconds long, except for some of the better known drivers. It will be professional drivers. They have to serve a bit of a handicap, extra 20 or for a couple of them, 40 seconds. That will all pan out. It'll be interesting to see also how the um, garage goes at the heart, father and son. We've got a dome in here with the Bolivian driver Ortiz who raced it in period. Every car's got a history, hasn't it, Snowy? All these cars have all got great histories. So 43 minutes on the clock, and really what we've got to do, what we've got to do is just uh, get them through the first couple of laps, and I think things will sort themselves out. That Maserati, um, I think it's been started by the owner, but uh, Alex Muller, ex-former 3000 driver, I think did the time in practice. That car may go backwards a bit early on. We'll have to watch that situation. Lovely Porsche, number 29, just going through your picture there. TVR for the TVR fans, uh, Peter. 
We saw a few on the way down, didn't we? We saw a lot. Quite some, a few on the way some, down. Some of them are still going. No, no, I wasn't going to go there. Don't do, don't do the TVR generalisations. No. People from Blackpool made some very good cars, some very successful race cars yeah. over the years. But uh, good to see them out there. And it is an extraordinary, uh, eclectic feeling yeah. as well, I would say. Another past winner of this race, uh, Eric, overall winner, Eric Ellery. He's driving a Celine with uh, Gerard Lopez, who used to own the Lotus Formula One team at one stage. So the safety car lights are out and we are ready to go racing. It's a pleasant morning. It's certainly not cold, but it uh, has been raining overnight. And can, I, can I just do an honourable first mention, John? And I, I will, I will, my apologies. Sorry, John. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, on, honourable mention for uh, an Aston right up there, Darren Turner, ex uh, works uh, driver. Uh, got that uh, DBR S9, right, DR9 actually, right up there, fifth place, I think it is, sixth or something, in a, in a full uh, GT1 Aston. And also in an Aston, haven't seen him for a long time, Thomas Enger, another ex factory driver, got into Formula One briefly, um, got banned from racing um, for a short period of time. We'll also be watching those. Uh, Mike Newton always goes well in his, his uh, Lola MG, but this is going to be an absolutely cracking race. But the thing about all of these, I think, is you've just got to enjoy them from what, yeah. from what they are. This one is a one off um, in terms, it, it's not part of, of the uh, aggregate for the weekend, so we don't have to worry about adding things up. This one we just enjoy. We'll just go confirm the starting grid again. It is that Pescarolo uh, on pole position. Look at the times, by the way. That would have been uh, a decent uh, GT time this year, and it was done in rather inclement, uh, uh, inclement conditions overnight. The Lola, of course, is a uh, was a P2 car, and that is the pool for P2. Ninth position, Mike Newton, um, who was instrumental at RML in that particular project. Two RML project cars here, actually, because that's the lead yep. S7R, which is the oldest Semco car further down. Gerard Lopez uh, is the pole in the GT1B down in 32nd yeah, that, position. That car led its category, remember, went with Molem driving it. In the wet. In the wet. And, I remember um, it very well. Very interesting. Yeah, I see Molem's name is still on the side of it. It was spelt wrong then, and it's still spelt wrong now. It, it was the car that they ran for a Semco in the States yeah. that um, was somewhat hamstrung by using Pirelli tyres. They did a huge yeah. amount of, of testing with Pirelli tyres and it didn't really make a lot of difference to it. One on debut, uh, the Celine, of course, at Sebring in the hands of Conrad, assisted by RML with... Oli Gavin. Oli Gavin. Yeah. Um, it was battered, it was bruised, it had half a rear diffuser left to it, and it still got through. It was an yeah. extraordinary project. It took, it took shape outside my office window, that yes. project. Yes, and I think it, it launched Oli Gavin into his... Tremendous career with the um, with Corvette, didn't it? Well, uh, ironically, beat the Corvettes there. Yes, it did, yes. They but decided uh, they better have well, a bit of yeah, that. Yeah. Um, there is a, there is one of the factory Corvettes in here, an ex Maxson class winning car here at Le Mans. Nigel Greensall is uh, driving that. Well, that will not be slow, will it? No. Um, so here they are. Just, I mean, uh, w when we were down the paddock, John, they were going. We were talking to Gregor Fiskin. Is it slicks? Is it, is it wet and is it, it's one of those really tricky uh, situations. So just look at the track here, Peter, because this is wetter here than where we're sitting. Well, we said that, didn't we, Andrew, on the way back? I uh, uh, hadn't seen the track conditions, so it's hard to actually say that you need to be out there. This is Indianapolis and Arnage, by the way, that the guys are talking yeah. about. There's, up. There's, there's, bro there's bodies up and it's raining again. Wipe, wipe us wrong. So, like, I, would, I would go back from what I said half an hour ago when we did our um, Park Fermi, not Park Fermi, work at the assembly area walk of. It almost looked like it was dry enough then to, to risk a slick to start because yeah. how long do you want to be out there? Some of the aero cars will clear the track a lot a lot quicker, uh, as you'll know only too well, John. And but you, you don't want to be out there in, in jeopardy, do you? Uh, no. Some of the, you know, these are mightily I, mightily quick cars. I we, think most people are on wet there. I'm I, surprised if they're not. I, I think you would you would risk it for 15 minutes. This is a pit stop race. Uh, it's absolutely pouring coming back in towards yep. the Porsche curve. So coming out of Arnage, 
uh, and heading up into the third sector. All of the brollies have gone up at the start-finish line, and visibility is going to be an issue. Now, anybody who's on wow. slicks now is in real trouble. And in wow. fact, the safety car lights have gone back on again. Yeah. I'm not sure we're going to go for well, a start. I'm here. not sure you're right about the, the tyre choice because Ooh. when we were down in the paddock area, they were all on slicks and it <laughs> hadn't started raining. It started raining right at the okay. last few minutes. And you saw the picture uh, on the screen of uh, wet weather tyres being prepared. Problem uh, for uh, uh, Morsler. Yes. This is the number 31 car. And that was... Uh, that was at the second chicane and the parishotels.com sponsored machine in bright orange and black has ground to a halt. I think they're going to bring these guys in the pit lane. I think they're going to allow everybody to do a, a tyre change. I think you're I right. Think that's smart. Yeah. Oh, there's one of the uh, ex IMSA BMWs yeah, that are yeah. out yeah. there, the Milner yeah. Racing yeah, Car. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, see, you can look at the entry list. This is a bit like the Nürburgring 24 yeah. hours, Peter. Um, except every single race is like this here, where you look at the entry list and you think you've got it in your head, and then you go, oh, oh hang on a minute, I didn't see that yeah. there. <laughs> exactly I mean, so. Yeah, there we go. Just, Just around the, the outside yeah. of the circuit, they are displaying the, uh, uh, the, the red and yellow striped uh, flags, which in the old days used to be when I first started racing, was called called the oil flag. Of course, yep. it's now the slippery surface flag. And I think that's something been the on same the track that shouldn't be. Exactly. Could be for debris as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sli slippery surface. It's been displayed. For, now, I, th I think John's absolutely right. Carl, there's a lot of activity uh, with. Um, now here's the question, the guys. Lane. Does this mean this is? Are we going to start the clock? 43 well, yes. minutes here. The BMW safety car lights went back on. Oh, now there's some people not coming in and yep. all cars have been told to enter the pit lane and the leading four cars have not come in and oh, they're going to have uh, to cut across yeah. and therefore the lead has changed the let's all drama here <laughs> straight away we can get right into it the lead has changed in the pit lane and we've got emmanuel collard cutting across into it so they obviously haven't spoken to him and the maserati mc12 leads into the pit lane now we've got also a I think some are going around still, John. I think there's a lot of yeah, people lot going, going around. around still, a lot of the GT well, cars. Do we think those people had... The problem is, the safety cars got in the pit lane, we're still under yellow, it's and it's a red flag. red flag. It's a red flag. It's chaos. It's chaos to start. This is it's... what happens when the weather changes. Well, I, 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 I wonder how many people can talk to their drivers. Yeah, probably most, I would have thought. I mean, that, that is quite extraordinary. From literally half an hour ago, Andrew and I were walking through the assembly area, where, and the sun had just come out. Gre Gregor Fiskin had that conversation with us. He said, what do you think? And so and so. And we are walking back through, and the sun was coming out. We are thinking, hang on, this, this could really be... It might be start on, on drives. Looking at the track, not, not a hope on earth. Darren Turner steered out. Yeah. Now, Darren Turner is a star in wet weather. I remember the beginning and end of my meteorological forecasting <laughs> career was at Cota in a WEC race that I was doing for TV. It had rained at the same time every single day, and it was in... Uh, part way through the race and it started to rain and I famously said it's a passing shower it's done this every day if if it was me I'd stay out there and struggle around and not risk an extra pit stop Darren Turner did no. and stayed on the track and uh, everybody else fell off uh, down at the end of the back straight and they actually red flagged the race and gave everybody a free tyre change in the pit, in the pit, which I thought was a, a little bit unfortunate for, DC, for, for DT. So they've gone round here, but these cars will have to come in. It's a red flag. They'll have to come back into the pit lane. And the, I'm, uh, in fact, we're not showing the timing having started. So that's the key thing, Andrew. Yeah, very interesting situation here. So the wet's being bolted on, and uh, we didn't mention there's a second Bentley uh, in this race as well by the mysterious uh, Mr. Mr. B. Mr. John of B, I should call him. So, so. Now, just think, they're going to have to reorder this entirely now, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's it'll have to go back. It'll have to go back and just restart, effectively. So yeah. what, what just went out there didn't really happen. Ignore exactly. that. Exactly, ignore that. That was a parade but Ignore that, but don't ignore drivers, how they're feeling at the moment, all psyched up to go racing. Oh, look, look. We're seeing two uh, pro drive, and of um, course fuel on board. Fuel on board. Uh, yes, I would think they would have extra. I, I, I mean, I don't think. Uh, I'm sure. Just coming out of the pits now, the 
uh, Ford GT, running number 40, of course, uh, in the fabulous colours that we saw. That was third. That got yeah. on the podium here. It did. Um, was it the Roberts family? Uh, well, it was the Robertsons, yeah. Yeah, Robertsons. The Robertson family. Um, yeah. That was... Terrific effort, actually. That, was. that, that really was, because that car really wasn't... A, a a, 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 it wasn't a racing car, neither was it um, that competitive. Also in the pit lane, the Celine, the Assemco Celine, still running its GT1 decals from the, as it was then, American Le Mans series, yeah. previous iteration of IMSA, and Eric Ellery along with its owner in this yeah. car. They're driving two cars, so they're going to make a pit stop at some stage and, and swap. I, I think that... I wonder if Emmanuel Collard and Francois Perraud will do that, or they'll just steal. No, they weren't nominated. Um, oh, right, so they're just doing it singly. Yeah, I mean, actually, originally Collard's car was nominated to have Henri Pescarolo driving it. Henri's not so well, so uh, I'm not sure he's here this weekend, which is a shame. The Celine, of course, Wellingborough's uh, finest uh, supercar. Uh, built just off the ring road by RML. Designed, conceived, developed, and originally raced by RML. Took an out, Selena 7R took an outright victory, outright victory in the ELMS under bizarre conditions, uh, I seem to remember. At, um, you see, I should have looked this up, shouldn't I? It was at, I think it was at Jerez. Mm -hmm. I just seeing on the screen. Oh, Harama, Harama. Restart, suspended, race will resume behind yeah. safety cars. Well, they haven't started, nobody's losing time no. at the moment. No. I suspect that some of those cars that went around, looking by, looking at the time that they were and the way they were driving, I suspect that they, in the middle and towards the back of the field, were actually already on wet tyres, and that's what we were. That's what I was basing yeah, what I saw they when might. they were coming out of uh, Arnage. GMB Ferrari just going out of the pit lane, wearing its number forty-eight. It's bad enough to have windscreen wipers. OK, we've doubled up on the safety cars now at the exit of the pit lane. If you're just joining us, good morning. A little bit of chaos caused by the weather. Rain at Le Mans never happens. And it's all thrown things into a little bit of... a little bit of a spin. As the cars were coming towards the Porsche curves on their formation lap, the rain started falling heavier. Quite a lot of the teams at the front are elected to go on slicks. The race control, which is under the auspices of Eduardo Freitas, none other than Eduardo Freitas, former joint Formula One race director and still WEC race director. Eduardo will be loving this. He is such an enthusiast. And I think made the right decision to put the safety car lights back on and to tell all the cars to come into the pit lane. It's caught one or two teams out who clearly weren't expecting to do to have to do a pit, la a pit lane tyre change, and they've been back to their paddocks on their golf carts and their trolleys, and now they're back. Now, some of these cars do not have single centre lock rims. They will have four or five studs on some of these cars. Um, Dodge Viper in the pit lane, in the Festina colours. Uh, yeah. that, that, what a beast that GTR was. Drove the road-going car for the first time here, actually, at Le Mans. The first car that came into Europe when the track was still open on a, Thursday, uh, on a Friday and you could drive around. And subsequently drove the Oric Assisa race car at Paul Ricard in a test. Amazing thing. Uh, H-pattern gearbox on those originally, Snowy. Proper three pedal car. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I drove one 20 years ago. You raced one, didn't you? I, I did, yes, well, 24 hours, 20, 20 years ago. And uh, it was the first car that, uh, well, I, I went out in free practice and uh, every, every gear change I did, I've always been pretty, pretty good at gear changes. Yeah. And I look after gearboxes, endurance racing, yeah. pass it to your teammate, etc., yeah. etc. Uh, and it was, it was, it was blipping and it was over revving. I couldn't understand it. And they'd forgotten to tell me it was the first car driven with what they call mid gas. Uh, as an auto blip, which is now just obviously just yeah. not in place, but I had no idea. I was revving, the, revving this poor old V10. It, uh, it didn't cause any damage, but it was just, it wasn't it was overly synchronized, if you like. So, uh, the one that I drove, and bear in mind, it was literally a pickup truck 
gearbox on that car. <laughs> it was not, to start with, a, a full racing gearbox, and it was not sequential. It was an H pattern. Going from second to third, or second to fifth, and I think in those days it was only a five-speed box, the original cars, um, you couldn't tell the difference because it had so much torque that it just pulled. And I think for the first couple of gear changes, I went from second to fifth and thought, I just feel like it's pulling back. And then when I found third and it took off like the snake that it was meant to be, ah, that's what it's meant to... Right, I shall have to be a bit... That was at Ricard. And we were doing nearly 200 miles an hour down the back straight. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, they, they were quick. I mean, they were quick. Eight, eight litre V10. It was just you know, massive. But quite user friendly, having oh, said all of yeah, that. Yeah, I, I always quite long in the wheelbase. I always described it as basically it was a big old E-type one slicks. Yeah, very good. So everybody coming into the pits, or most people coming into the pits, if you've just joined us, this is the Endurance Racing Legends. It's a 43-minute race, so this will obviously put us behind schedule a wee bit now. An eclectic grid that is for cars from the turn of the century up to. Uh, 2009, I think, is the the latest cars that we've got here because there's 430, there's a 430C uh, that I've seen, and I think yeah. that is the oh no, the Corvette C C6 uh, ZR1 must be a 2010, so it it must go to 2010. So from uh, from I'm, 1999 to 2010. Yeah, I'm sure you're right, John. But uh, just a terrific field of cars. But this weather's so changeable. We don't really know what it's going to do, do we? It, this wasn't um, particularly forecast uh, for heavy rain, light showers for most of the day. Uh, and we thought they were going to blow over this morning. There was a quite heavy rain overnight. The cars, by the way, were practicing on the full closed circuit until three o'clock this morning. And we bailed out a little bit before that, uh, as there was uh, no TV coverage of that, of course. So you haven't missed anything. And. <laughs> It was rather nice for a change to be back at our digs and listening to cars go around. It's been a while since I've heard racing engines to lull me into my dreamy sleep. Slumbers. Slumbers, yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't think it happened, John, but what are we, three weeks ago since the, yeah. the, main, the main event? Yeah. Uh, I remember doing that very, very first um, session and down in the pit lane uh, for you until four o'clock till six o'clock and walking back in. It was just starting to spit a bit with rain as I came back to the TV compound. And then... You're sitting in the TV compound looking at the monitor, and it's absolutely torrential on the other side of the track. Correct. Open the door, this here, and was thinking, no, is, it, is, is, is this the same circuit? And it, expecting it to come across, and it didn't. It cut across the corner. I didn't think three weeks later it would do exactly the same again, but it has. Had to. So the Bentley EXP Speed 8, this is the 2002, so the, the, the version before Earlier, yeah. the winning car. And it, still, they, they look incredible. Incredibly current, don't they? Those cars. Mr. John and B is actually a guy called John uh, Gillard, I think something like that. He's got a big, um, he's big in the carbon fibre business apparently. Oh, Gitard, Gitard, yeah. He has a company in the UK as well as in France. I think it's mainly aerospace rather than racing cars. He's got the most. It's handy if you've got a lot of cars, yeah. though, Andrew. He's got it? the exactly. most. He's got the most fantastic collection of French racing cars. He's got. Matra sports cars, he's got Matra Formula One cars, he's got four or five different Ligiers, just incredible collection of motor cars that he owns, Mr. John of B. Now, here's the problem for uh, the, the guys who uh, stopped, the guys who didn't stop. So there's going to be a certain amount of um, refettling of the grid in the pit lane now, the air hammers you can hear in the background are for another MG. Uh, this is in the works colours, and the Hot Wheels sponsored car. Again, um, fantastic uh, project here. Lola chassis in the what was then the 675, the lightweight spiritual successor, really, to yeah. C2, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, AER engine, turbocharged. Yes. Um, highly turbocharged, actually, tended to have gasket problems at stages. People like Anthony Reid, I think Warren Hughes raced in that team. It was a sort of the last bit of MG, wasn't it, before it became Hughes Chinese? He, Hughes, he raced for RML and won, won twice. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were on for their third. The red, white and blue machine, the number 25, is the, the 
other version of that car. The, the turbos at the start of their life were so um, highly strung and highly um, stressed. St stressed, yeah, that at the end of a six hour race, you weren't getting full turbo boost because you'd worn the impeller so much. Yeah. Never mind at the end of a 24 hour race. Also out there, one of the, of, in terms of this decade, if you're talking about 1999 to 2010, 2009, the car of the decade, and some might say, the car of the millennia in terms of of the Le Mans 24 hours, the Audi R8, the open top Audi R8 with eventually the TFSI engine, the uh, fuel stratified injection, Ulrich Beretsky, the engine maestro who worked out along with his team how to mix the air and the fuel more efficiently to take it from about 28% efficiency in terms of the fuel burn to well over 40 percent huge step forward and of course we all benefited from yeah, that absolutely in our road cars if we drove audis went on to to use that in the diesel technology and in fact they were already playing with diesel technology in that early tfsi day with the sort of pressures that they were using for the fuel injection and for the compression ratio within the engine marvelous stuff in a car of course that they won uh, with the same car number three years in a row the number seven car yeah i noted that car had um philip peter's name on it um i think that was a sort of third string car really it wasn't that particular chassis um of course still got quite a lot of them racing in the states in fact uh, more of them yeah yeah a good friend of yours um encouraging all that brad, well. brad <laughs> kettler yeah. just outside indianapolis who was part of the audi winning team and if you've watched truth in 24 and Tune yeah. truth in 24 too brad still looks after quite a lot of those cars and in the uk progressive as well howden haynes another star of that film dave ward yeah. uh, if they aren't here they'll be watching well, no, gentlemen the, the progressive are running the bentley of course they are yeah, of course they are the they're running sean lynn's bentley yeah. yeah um they are over at brackley right in the middle of the carbon fiber triangle and uh, is that what you call it <laughs> oh, motorsport valley carbon fiber triangle <laughs> it goes it goes a bit further out you see yeah yeah, they're at Brackley and look after an extraordinary amount of cars specialising in all kinds of things. And also, in fairness, the pressurised drink systems that everybody still uses right up to FIA WEC, they make the best version of that. And H and Dave always working hard, right right yeah. opposite uh, uh, where uh, there's a, a nice little... Um, artisanal area around there on the outskirts of Brackley, just between Brackley Town Centre and where Petronas, AMG, Formula yeah, One are. Yeah. Um, uh, there, places there. Progressive were telling us just a few minutes earlier that they, Sean Lynn's got a second of those Bentleys, yes. which is being fettled at the moment. He, he will be competing in that. They've also got in their workshops at the moment, which I'm desperate for them to get finished so that I can have a go in it, a Audi UK uh, Quattro A4 British touring car. Aha. Um, as in Frank Baylor, John Bincliffe, etc., yeah. etc. Et I think it might be Bincliffe's winning car from Knock Hill. I'll have to ask H about that. That was John's first victory in the. Oh dear, where's that come from? Um, <laughs> in the British touring car championship, and it is exceptionally beautiful in its simplicity. Mm. And we thought at that time it was the most amazing and almost spaceshipy type thing and you look at it now and you go oh that's quite simple i think i'd have a go at that <laughs> for permanent four-wheel drive of course in those days was allowed in the british daring car championship just noticed uh, john on the entry there's somebody who didn't see originally tony valander is there yeah, sharing yeah. a a the 430 yeah with somebody who races under the name of mr Steele. i've no idea who he is yeah that is uh, that was the number 95 car i noticed it was name next to um which is the 2009 the evil yeah. 430 and that should be starting in 31st position apologies if you've joined us expecting to see cars moving quickly and you uh, instead of hearing the sounds of highly stressed racing engines you're hearing the sounds of uh, motorsport mutterings and musings from 
Peter Snowden, Andrew Murray and me, John Hindhoff. Uh, let me quickly bring you up to date. This is our first race of the weekend for the endurance racing legends. It should have on the front row when we restart the Pescarola C60 in the hands of Manuela Collard, the PlayStation Lassat. Uh, white, blue and green car alongside the red and white Toyota GT1 from 1999, Francois Perodo with that car. Then it's the Maserati MC12, the Bentley Speed 8, Dallara SP1, Aston Martin DBR9, another Curage C60, a Dome S101, which is the black and white, almost sort of camouflage looking car. Then Mike Newton on pole for the P2s with the Lola MG EX257 from 2001. 2001 heavens seems like yesterday it does to me <laughs> i moved moved down to take up the end of 1999 moving into 2000 moved down to uh the midlands to take up a job with rml and it was all around the saline and, and that sort of uh, area of time really seems to seem like yesterday unfortunately the rain came down on halfway around the formation lap and race control i think rather sensibly decided that they would uh, effectively bring everybody into the pit lane for a pit stop. Unfortunately, the message didn't get through to everybody and a few cars went through, even though the safety car lights were still on and they'd been told to follow the safety car into the pits. And so a red flag has been thrown and we are now in the throes, Peter Snowden, of reorganizing and getting everybody on the right tires. And the irony of this is that probably by the time we've done this, it'll start drying up again. Well, it's that, that, that do I don't I dil dilemma, isn't it? Of you know, do you become a lemming and a sheep and follow the rest in, or do you stay out there and know your own mind and what tyres you're on? So if you've started on wets already, and you see everybody peeling in, you think, well, that's 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 their loss. I chose the right tyres. I'm staying out here. You may not be able to communicate with your team to do that. And then of course it gets red flagged. At RSL underscore studio, hello to Christoph B joining us. What a grid for the endurance legend. Wowzers, he said. That's his word, not mine. Uh, Heath Giles, down under, watching for the first time. He said, well, you built the excitement for the aborted start. <laughs> uh, Peter Mackay, hello, PMAC. Multi-billion pound chaos in this first race. Great to see the Toyota GT1 back at Le South. And this is great from Johnny Fun 101, who I presume is back home in... Uh, Wills, hello Johnny, and good morning to you on a Saturday morning in the UK at what, just coming up to quarter past nine. Incredible how different these cars look in high definition TV compared to the old SD that we used to have to watch uh, them in. Tom Firth is uh, tuned in as well up in uh, Yorkshire. Hello Tom, uh, enjoying the, uh, already enjoying the action even though we've not had much and... Uh, finally, uh, Me Mark E.J. Medge, uh, locked on. My brother and I were, 20, uh, were there in 2018 for the Classic, and we both loved it. I think that was the last time I was here. Yeah, well, of course, then we didn't have the Classic until 2022. Uh, yes. COVID, we missed. Yes. Because uh, we didn't explain the Classics every two years. Correct. Normally, this time we've got it two years running. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether they're, they're, they're going to make it three years running. No, they? no, I, don't, I think, I think going it's going to go to twenty. It's going to go. It's going to move and go yeah. on to the odd years. Yeah, I think you're right. And of course, the Monaco Historic, which is another wonderful event, people should try and make. That is alter the, alternative years on, on the even years. Yes, correct. Exactly, yeah. So it takes the two of the big uh, events both of which yeah. we've worked on. Oh, ah, Let's pour a bit of water <laughs> on the turbo charges yeah. of the... Actually, that's not a turbocharged car, is it? Let's just pour a bit of water on to the intakes. That was a bit... Snowy and I are looking at each other with furrowed <laughs> brow there. What was he doing there? Yes, why was he doing... Well, it, was a, it was a 360, wasn't it? Yeah. 360 with the engine cover off. And yes. you say, I mean, a, a crate that you pack tools in normally, yeah. full of water being poured in all over the engine bay. So I'm, I'm assuming something has... Is it in for the concourse later on? <laughs> I wanted to clean well, it off. Yeah, exactly. With it washing off the suspension. Something's obviously reached a temperature that it's not, uh, not required. So at RSL underscore studio, if you want to get in touch, Eric Ellery uh, sitting in behind the wheel of a car that he's also very familiar with. We've got a Porsche uh, from... Now, that's interesting. That's the Yannick Dalmas 
Emmanuel Collard and Ralph Kellner's car with Virginia Julian Canal. So yeah. that's 1997. So that's that must be one of the earlier cars. That's a space frame car. And the next year they went to the carbon fibre. Yeah. The, that, the, those cars, the only thing that they shared with the 996, the reason they, they raced this car, Porsche came back into the GT ranks, of course, um, was because the new 996 was uh, the brand new car that had yeah. a stack full of marketing money, which is why it's it's got that shaped headlights. There were quite a, later cars had the round headlights, but the fried egg headlights. The only thing it shared with the the donut car um, was the front subframe, yeah. um, which also, of course, made its way uh, to become the 986 Boxster, um, one of the cars that probably saved Porsche for the amount of cars that they sold. More 911 than Boxster that first. Uh, 986. Another great car we haven't mentioned is a Ferrari 333. Did race here at Le Mans, not with much success. Well, they had great success at the Daytona 24 hours, never really worked around here. Won the 1999, yeah. the inaugural um, American Le Mans series. Yeah, Christian Glacial will be driving that car. The Triple Three was uh, Elliot Forbes Robinson won, won yeah. the championship in 99. And I remember going to do that series after the first Petit Le Mans in uh, 1998 and they never expected to do the full season Yeah. so they did the first couple of rounds and they were leading the championship so they thought well, we can't, we'll keep going until we get beaten and we're not leading the championship it and they one, didn't one, one of those strange <laughs> enigmas isn't it where a that car, that, just, car. that works so well it, yep. was, it was efficient in world yep. sports cars sports yep. car racing generally Peskers. and yeah. obviously it just absolutely stood out at Daytona Yet every time it got to the morn, it was like it's Nadir. It just didn't. And there was no reason why, there's nothing on paper that says it shouldn't work. Anybody who heard the triple three uh, in oh. period, you, you never forget it. Emmanuel Collard is reunited with a C60 and the man whose name it carries, Henri Pescarolo, is alongside it at the exit of pit lane uh, with a period Pescarolo jacket the on adults. from that era of the car it carries the number 16 which was um it's i think it was its race number here at Le Mans. i'm sure it was yeah, yeah. and the car with the green fluorescent green flashes which pester already always has on his helmet yeah and that goes back to when he was just a junior driver in, in formula three with matra they joso had a bright orange one he had the bright uh Green one, and I think Beltos had a bright blue one. Yeah. But Pesca's always kept that. Those those colours are almost synonymous with this race. Correct. The, the French blue with the with the, the lime green. Now, a little bit of a chat going on at the front of the pit lane with the right-hand driving position of the number one Zenit <coughs> red and white GT1. Uh, later on this weekend, in fact... Um, it is later on today, when we come back after lunch, we will have the parade of the Le Mans winners. Now, if you were here at the Van Quatre three weeks ago, there were 66 cars that had won Le Mans that went out for a couple of laps. And we are hopeful that the majority of those 60, I've been told, uh, majority of that 66, I've been told more than 60 yeah. will be out on the track for a couple of spirited laps. There's some very special drivers in that as well. It was one of the highlights of the centenary running of the 24 hours, and it will be reprised today, and we'll have that as our first bit of coverage this afternoon when we come back on air at uh, just before two o'clock. John, John, looking out of the commentary box, we're seeing blue sky now, so amongst the clouds. So this could all dry up. They're now all on the, the wet and might not be the right rubber to be on don't, anymore. Don't jinx it, Andrew. Don't no, jinx it. Try not to. But... Vitaphone Maserati MC12, the longest racing car ever. I'm not sure that that's it, true, but it uh, looked it, didn't it? It's certainly one of. Yeah, you know, I mean, it looked... Michael, it yeah. just looked big, didn't it? Looked absolutely huge out on the circuit ran under a waiver in the united states in imza i remember it almost getting all the way to the river at uh, lime rock park on a particularly wet outing michael bartles was a man yeah. that did a lot of the good stuff yeah. in that that was his sponsorship um 
a, a sort of a coffee. con almost a Conrad green on yeah, that car yeah. wasn't it we've seen a Conrad uh, Porsche on the grid in still in the famous Conrad colors Darren Turner qualified sixth and second best in GT's two just, just beggar to the uh, Maserati in the Intercontinental Hotel and Resort sponsored machine queues already forming at the Museum of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, 24 Heures du Mans. Uh, it, it, it's, it's been an extraordinary display for the last, uh, just over a month, actually. And it continues, I believe, until the end of July. So if you're coming by this way, heading down uh, for holidays, uh, then there's a good excuse to put, there's always a great excuse to do a lap around the public part of the circuit, but particularly interesting here. Now, we mentioned the dome uh, earlier on and as being one of the black and white yep. cars. Here's the, uh, this is the um, black and white squares. Well, that was, they were all sponsored there. So the Jan Lammers funded it by selling all these little sponsors. Ortiz drove the car in period. Yep. The uh, Bolivian driver, believe it or not. Can't be too many of those. Oh, some people bought more than one square. They had Jumbo Supermarket, of course, famous sponsor. But some of these were just, some people just had a single square or a rectangle, actually. Yeah. Rears, uh, rears then, wheels on there for the yeah. race wheels. Judd engine, Judd power, of course, on that. The John's Judd, who seemed to just keep turning out wonderful yeah. engines that were tremendously reliable at sound. Yeah, but that was, that's what I was going to say. Sound, particularly the V10. Yeah. Because we've got V8 and V10 Judds. So once again, uh, good to have your company with uh, Snowy, Andrew Marriott and me, John Hindorf. Hello to Revs Limited, great to be watching Le Mans, seeing all these amazing machines. Uh, Bista Flywheel seems so long ago now, have a great <laughs> weekend. We had a really good time two weeks ago at Bista Flywheel uh, and at the festival. Thank you to all of you who uh, turned up. Uh, we. I suppose what we can say is the changeable weather has given us more time to see some of these cars in great detail. Uh, well, the track is drying up. Yeah, right. There's a dry line now. Oh, yeah. we're, we're obviously can see. There's a dry line, it. Snowy. I'm looking at you. There's a dry line there. Well, I, th I think you and I've got different ideas on dry lines. A less <laughs> wet line. Then. All right. There's a less less wet line. May maybe an intermediate line at yeah. best. On that particular shot we saw, but uh, yeah, I mean it's. Uh, it's exactly what we said at the beginning, wasn't it? It's what do you go out and I, I cannot believe the difference between uh, that just walking in from the, the assembly area and how much it's changed that quick in 10 minutes. Uh, it, was, it was really marginal what to do, and it, that became very, very apparent on that uh, first parade lap, as it were. Pinos, lap. Pinos Roadster in the Vistion colours. Of course, that car broke the mould and basically put the engine back in the front original cars with the Roush tune Ford uh, V8 and uh, well they made a great noise as well but a different noise that was more like the the Sauber Mercedes type of yeah, noise that that rattled your sternum yeah. as they went past it was a much lower noise I but think it, what we're doing it, now by the way is we are going to roll out what was supposed to be coming up next which was is some hot laps for BMW and Porsches. I saw some cars coming round onto the front straight and I wonder if they're going to run those around for a couple of laps to A, get that out the way, which was only supposed to be five minutes, because we're running something close to 50, five zero minutes uh, away. Great to see the Deutsche Bank X markets prototype there, which led the race in the hands uh, of Martin Shaw for about 250 metres, but it did lead. No, it was a bit more than yeah. that. Vanina X was part of that as well, and she's here this weekend. Uh, shortly, I'm sure it will be watching on somewhere. The next well, generation they, they, of short drivers coming I think through. It was the year before we see that driver line up when uh, they finished fourth overall, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Uh, Shorty uh, Barbosa. And Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall, yeah. yeah memory still works. The, uh, well, shortly discovered Joao Barbosa, uh, yeah. who's gone on to, and he's still racing, still yeah. racing in I'm winning. the US. And winning, yes, absolutely. He's still a tremendous driver. Champion uh, 
sorry, Mobile One colours on the 52 Porsche 911, the wide body GT2 car that was just being pushed down the pit lane. Now, I'm not sure what all the activity was on the start finish line, so I may have no. to, I may have to back pedal a bit, but I can hear engines fired. And safety lights are going on the safety car. Yeah. So I think it's promising. Yeah. I think, John, the second safety car we saw at the end of the pit lane a few minutes ago has actually has gone out onto track, and there's some some kind of smallish parade to fill in uh, while this bit, because obviously those cars came in in two different staggered groups. It's a long lap round here, so it's going to take a while to reshuffle those into grid order in the pit lane, normally in the assembly area. So the cars will be back in their original grid setup that we talked about before. We'll go through that in a we moment. That's Mike, Mike Newton. Newton. Mike Newton having a little, little yep. snooze in the car. Yeah. He's, he's visualising. Oh, he's heard he's us. He's heard us. <laughs> he's got the radio on. Of course he has. Yeah, our radio. And the race will resume behind the safety car. Now, what we've got to keep an eye on is whether the clock actually starts um, when they disappear out of the pit lane. And we've got some uh, classic Porsches out there being led round by the Porsche safety car and the rainbow colours of the 75th anniversary of Porsche road cars. Dr Ferdinand Porsche famously saying, I wanted a car, I couldn't buy the one I wanted, so I built it instead. His other great quote is, the last car ever driven will be a sports car. <laughs> which I love. I, I hadn't heard that. That's wonderful. That's, that's a good one. That's great. The Porsche Heritage Collection is based right in outside of our, uh, right outside of our commentary booth, and those are the cars that are out on the circuit at the moment. Of particular note is the very, very dark purple, uh, the recreation 964 that is uh, running towards the back. An absolutely beautiful car from Porsche Classic. Alexander Farbig is the man who organises Porsche Classic and Porsche Heritage. And out of a, a very clever, um, infinitely extendable, pretty much, warehouse in, uh, in Stuttgart, or just outside Stuttgart at, at Porsche, it is modular design. So every year, a new parts book comes out and every year, there's new, originally, uh, original uh, spec parts coming out for all kinds of Porsches, and they've added a bit more to the the warehouse. The parts books themselves have become collectible. Yeah. Uh, I've got first four, I think. So they're out on track at the moment, just to give those around the circuit something to look at whilst we're sorting things out here under this delay for bad weather. Well, we're almost an hour delay yeah. now, aren't we? Yeah. I'm just wondering when we do get underway again, I wonder if the race will be shortened as a result of it. This We've this got... This early in the weekend, as it were. There is a little bit of uh, of slack built into the... Uh, in, in, into... 30-minute 30, 30 contingency? We've got? Uh, well, for us, yes, yes but a bit more. Than... The car that's leading the Porsche parade, by the way, is um, very interesting. It is the um, Le Mans Centenary edition of the, the 911. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's a highly limited edition and the likes of me will not be able to get on the list for it. Uh, but it's uh, running with the GT3 wheels and one of a, a number of car companies, Porsche, one of a number of car companies who are um, marking, honoring the 100th anniversary of the 1923 race with uh, special editions and Porsche of course having been involved since the late 1940s uh, in in this race in one way or another quite extraordinary and still have of course the most victories uh, in terms of overall victories yep. and class victories here they were in some ways forced back into racing uh, when Audi, they had 16 and Audi I think got up to 12 or 13. So decided to come back into the racing. They added another three before they disappeared again. And now they're back with the 963. Last weekend you were at Watkins Glen, saw a Porsche victory. Which then became a BMW victory. Because, explain. Uh, because there was half a mil out on the right height at the front. But rules is rules. Not like Penske. 
uh, not like Penske, but it's not been a very Penske-like season, it to be honest, uh, and Le Mans in particular yeah, yeah. was not. Now, this is very promising as the cars are being rolled out into position behind the safety car, behind which the race will resume at some stage, so we get more chances to look at phenomenal cars uh, and they're still shuffling some around to yes. try and get into the right position. A bit difficult to do this in the pit lane to regrid them all, which and is I basically what they've had to do. I suspect, Andrew, that is why they are trying to um, get them onto the track so that they've got themselves a little bit more room to do that. The uh, 550 Ferrari is there still. I think one of the best, best-looking GT cars of the era of 20 years ago. Race, yeah. Raced against them, and it, I always thought one of those things. That they, I think it was Martin Brundle that said years ago about a Grand Prix car, and it applies to pretty well any racing car, that uh, to him, a, a Formula 1 car should look like it's doing 200 miles an hour standing <laughs> still. <laughs> and I thought it was, a, it was a great line. It, 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 if it looks good, it is. If it looks right, it is right. And I always thought those 550 Ferraris were, they just had something about them. Of course, it evolved into the, the 575. Uh, I remember them turning up in uh, FIA GT in, in 2003 and uh, winning the first round at Barcelona. Yeah. And we stood on the pit wall and we, we were we were low. We didn't even get to the podium. We were fifth. We've got to do that for private entry. But I remember saying that's something when somebody said it's uh, that that's it. It's Ferrari o'clock. That kind of set the set the mood for the year. To be honest, we said we got uh, two of the ex factory drivers, or obviously Darren Turner is still a factory driver, um, with Thomas Enger also in the car. But I noticed Peter Cox, the uh, Dutchman. Is in another 550 Maranello somewhere down there. So um, nice to have, great to reunite these guys with their, the cars that they had so much success in and bringing back so many memories. And Xavier Mischer on there. And, the and, and what, a, and what an honour for the owner as well to, I know. to have the, the, one of the original drivers from period in your car. Yeah. It's, uh, forget provenance of value and history and all that, but it, it's just what, what an occasion to have somebody. And of course, you. you can't beat that intel as well because they're going to jump in it and it's find things, point. know things, and say, "Hang on, no, no, don't, don't do that. Turn it left, don't turn it right, because that doesn't work." And I remember this, and you, you can't. Well, you can buy that, I guess, but uh, there's nothing like having it just just built in, intuitive, having driven the car in period. The grid being ruled out. Quick, I mean, the 550M, the road car to me is probably, in my limited experience best GT, and I mean GT in the proper use of the word Grand Tourer, is probably the best GT car I've ever driven. And uh, it, manual, 550M, um, I, yes, I would make room for that, and everybody who knows knows I'm a bit of a porsche file. but there's oh, just you? something... Well, it's a bit like you and your Astons, isn't it? But you've got a Porsche tucked away. Oh, two, two scoops in 30 seconds, eh? There, you, you've got... You, everybody knows you for Aston's, but you've got, you've got your Porsche tucked away. Yeah, yeah, yep. Can't beat a Porsche, does what it says on the tin. Does, absolutely right. People sports car. Um, and some big names on some of these cars who raced the cars in period. The um, Ferrari 360 did the launch of the road car up in the northeast. Um, that's 4.30 in the pit lane up wearing the number 95, but the Ferrari 360, I remember doing the launch of that at Croft for the then Reg Vardy group and uh, doing all the talking bits and doing a bit of driving around there. And that was one of those days, Peter, and you know this because you've done plenty of work like that down through the years for manufacturers doing car launches. We weren't allowed to take the 360 out onto the track. We could present it and have people walk around it in Sydney because it was the only one. Yep. Uh, however, in order to uh, make people's day a little bit more interesting, we had the track booked. I'd booked the track out for them, and they could take their own cars out. So that day I got to drive a Ferrari F50 for the one and only right. time that I've ever been in it. And what a beast that was. That must have been an extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary experience. <laughs> Well, it's funny you say how things have evolved now, because I was actually at uh, Brands Hatch last weekend for Ferrari Passione. Yes, of course. Which is exactly the same thing, Clienti Corsa looking after you know, the new vi the VIPs, the VVIPs, etc. And exactly the same, a couple, a couple of cars turned up, the new Roma Spider, oh. again, not allowed on the track, because it was... 
the, the one. only one. But interesting, you're saying about driving their own cars on track. They had on display uh, a 365, yes, and next to it an F40. And did they go on the track? Did they, heck. They stayed there in the yeah, paddock really? on display, polished, put away again. I don't think I even hear them run, actually, which is a shame. F but F40 a car that you could have replaced the throttle with a light switch. It's a poster car though, isn't it? Oh, we grew up lusting after those things. What's that going through? The number 13. That's the very dark blue. It's the Courage. 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 It's, it's the other C60, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That and yeah. Da David Hart. David Hart's done his in... Uh, uh, in just neat, so I call it. We call it naked carbon, didn't we? It's naked black. Yeah. This one, and this is in royal blue. But no, no other decals apart from just a Lassard on it and Courage. What it is, and that's it. By the way, the 356 SL Porsche that was at the front of that parade, along with the Centenary 992, was Porsche's first winner in class at Le Mans, and Rod Emery uh, restored it, um, thanks to Peter Mackay for his extremely impressive Porsche knowledge. He is a font of all things Porsche. And the, his Porsche Spider book, due out sh shortly, we'll uh, get a hold of a copy of that and have a little review for you. So on the front of the grid, right, let's go. We, we're getting close to this now. I can, I can feel this. Uh, good vibes. Whistles from the pit lane can only possibly mean that we are either starting or stopping engines. There's still people being pushed into place further down. House, however, uh, we have got a grid like no other with 72 cars going from, what did we say, 1997 up to 2010, spanning a tremendous just over decade of Le Mans history in this 100th year of the world's greatest motor race. The Perodo car, I think, was the pole sitter here in 1999. Martin Brundle, Emanuele Collard, and Vincenzo Sospiri were the drivers. Oh, ex Formula 3000 champion, wasn't Yeah, it? absolutely. And the other car that year was driven by Boots and Kellners and McNish, mm. who they poached from Porsche, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Um, and Boots had had a big crash and broke his leg here in the morning. Yes, yeah. Um, and the two, they, had, they ran three cars both years. Um, and the other was were Japanese drivers, and they were the only ones that managed to finish. Yeah. So Katayama, Toshio, Suzuki, and, and Sakaya, who finished second in 99, I think. And Katayama was driving the car when it had the puncture at absolute feet. Oh, yes, that was... And, and it happened to be the onboard shot pointing back at his face yeah. when it um, happened. Yeah. And it was extraordinary. His face didn't change. His hands moved <laughs> quickly, but his face didn't change. There was no sign of anything. And it, to have a blowout at that kind of speed, <laughs> quite extraordinary. It's Engines have fired, gentlemen. Are we excited? Yes, we are. Are you ready to be entertained? You will be. This is our first race of the weekend. Three minutes to go. All down the field, interesting and exciting cars. As I said earlier, all with, with histories. Some, as they say in America, more storied than others. But, uh... You can stop that right now. The Cannibal Chevrolet from IMSA in 1998, Edouard Dugump behind that. The wheel of the number 51 car, front engine sports car. Yep. Trying to do it on Panos, not very, not as successfully. Uh, nowhere near, said. no. Well, indeed. hardly at all, actually. <laughs> so, let's go down the grid again, for those of you just joining us. Feast your eyes and ears on what we have for you. Front row is Pescarolo C60 on pole position with Emmanuel Collard behind the wheel. Francois Perodo has his Toyota GT1 from 1999, the number one red and white car. Then it's the blue, of course it has to be Maserati blue, MC12 GT1 from 2005. Sean Lynn in the dark green looks black in this kind of light. Brilliant, proper British racing green, no metallic. Absolutely proper as we roll out of the pit lane, the Bentley Speed 8 from 2003. Then it's the Dallara SP1 from 2002, the number 58 car. Darren Turner is the second of the GT cars in the Intercontinental Hotel sponsored Aston Martin DBR9 from 2006. 
Olivier Hart and the 34, uh, Courage C60 from 2005. Then the Dome S101, the black and white checkered car from 2003. That's the number 15 car. The top 10 made up by the Paul Sidman LMP2, the red, white, and blue Lola MG EX257 from 2001. Mike Newton, owner and driver of the number 25 car. And Joe McCowry, the well known London car dealer, with his Maserati MC12 GT1 from 2005. Third in GT1B in the 46. After that, spot things like the Pianos Esperante, which we've mentioned, the 550 Maranello, the Pro Drive car, the GT1 Evo from 1997, that number 101 Porsche, the Viper GTSR, the R8 Bentley LMP from 2002, another one of the EXP Speed 8s, but the 2002 car from Mr. John B. And, 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 and it's just extraordinary and they are rolling through Turt Rouge and down towards the Daytona again. And the clock has started John, yeah, so we're showing 41 minutes yeah. to go. I think cars weaving out on the track to try and get a bit of temperature into those wets and uh, Snowy, I don't know you're, you're able to look at the track conditions here. It's definitely drying but maybe not that quickly. It might just help it might get them to the window well, the pit stop window, which I think is 20 minutes in. I think, the, 15, I think the often about there being the ing, dry ing. Dry it's not ing. dry, it's on the way. Well, you know, this, the thing about Le Mans is a lot of people forget it's a long linear circuit. You know, it, 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 it's not a sort of roundy shaped circuit, it's a long thin circuit. Yes. And, and at one end, you North know, it's completely south, different to hit. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. But what's, what's going to make the difference here is, of course, this is a, a, a pit stop race. As to where the, where the window is, yeah. as to where your tyre choice is yeah, going out, yeah. you don't want to be out on the wrong tyre for too long, whether that be wet, intermediate or dry. So what we might start with will overheat if you're not careful. Yeah. So, so there's the other point I was going to make. Just like in a contemporary race now, you've got a situation where your starting driver may be handing over, may not be, but there has to be a pit stop for everybody yes. of a compulsory time. It's supposed to be about uh, a minute stationary, but there are some... Um, additions for some of the pro drivers as part of the BOP, effectively a handicap. So, do you save your tyres in this first stint with everybody on Michelin wets? Or do you th say, you know what, this is going to dry up, I'll, I'll route them, I don't care, because we're going to have to put a, a set of yeah. slicks on halfway through, or even another set of wets. Well, that's the through. point. And what tyres you've got, of course, accepted convention is, is normally that you tend to put your faster driver out first if you can. But that may not be the case here. It might be better to put your gentle driver. Yeah, in. I if, think that's if why. There's a big, if there's a bigger gap in in performance, shall we say? I think that's what they've done with the Maserati, which yeah. starts third. I think uh, Alex Muller is going to so second. Put them out in a, in, yeah. on a safer tyre in the tricky yeah. conditions. Yeah. That may sound slightly odd, but just let them let them go around. Let your faster driver come in when it's drier. Hopefully, then you've got someone like Francois Perot, you mentioned, John, who is not an amateur driver. No, he might really. might be in. Wreck or something, but he's not in this in a in a in a Formula One car. Sorry, a Toyota GT1 <laughs> well, Formula One yeah, car. Formula Sorry, one car. yes, <laughs> pretty much. The, uh, there's a there's a very funny piece of audio when we did our inside Toyota at Cologne. Of I really wish it had been on video of uh, Nick Damon getting into the road going version of that car long before it was a museum. It got in fine, not so easy to get out with the wide. Uh, with the wide sills. Hello to David Williams, who's tuned in to Maxi, to Max UK 2000, uh, 2009. Uh, drove back from Pit Lockery to Bit Brick. Oh, Pit Lockery, good distilleries up there. I hope you saw the salmon run as well. Uh, and also to Simon H, some of those classic cars. Wouldn't look out the place on the grid racing in Weck today. Totally agree. Sarah Rigby uh, watching uh, the cars. Remembering the races in the FIA GT1 World Championship. And Jan, awesome, live listening and watching to us this morning. And Jerry Z is uh, up and about, but he's listening on RS1, part of the radio show, the limited network of audio and visual channels. If you're travelling around today and you're in the car, please don't watch the video. <laughs> we, we, we have got the audio for you via the RadioLamont.com player on RS1. So everything that we're doing here on the World Feed TV, the audio is duplicated, or if you're a bit bandwidth challenge as well, at RSL underscore studio, 
Visibility is what we expect it to be an issue, and that's exactly what it is, Andrew, even on this formation lap yes. effectively behind the safety car lap. Yes, obviously, we've, we've got the beauty of seeing the pictures, and I know quite a lot of people listening to us don't, so we'll try to describe what we see. And what we just saw was a very big ball of spray, and it's not like that all around the circuit, just as Snowy was it's, saying before. It seems to be the southern end of the circuit yeah, down towards from Mulsanne up to the little yeah. uh, the, the right left at Indianapolis and Arnage and we are going to start yep. this time around the safety car or lights the BMW lights have gone out and therefore we will be getting underway at the end of this lap and indeed Francois Parodo and Emmanuel Collard they are forming up into a side-by-side -side start I'm not sure they've realized that they're behind the safety car uh, and, and the amazing thing is that Collard has really trained Francois to be the great driver he is Absolutely. now. You know, that, it's an interesting relationship. But I think on track, no quarter will be asked or given. On a test day, I was once passed on the right hand side by Emmanuel Collard in the Van Merkstein Porsche Spider, which also is owned oh, by, yeah, by, uh, by Francois Perodo. Whilst Perodo decided it was a good idea to go around the other side of me in a Porsche in a Peugeot 908. <laughs> what was a a bit, what a that was a, a bit of a wake up call. So, green flag racing for the first time at the Le Mans Classic for 2023. The 11th edition is underway, and the two friends and teammates are side by side through Dunlop for the first time and into the chicane. And Collard goes through, slightly misses his breaking point there. Yeah. After Hall, in fact, he's gone off the track, so he'll have to give that position back. Track limits applying here as well as at the Osterreich ring, sorry, the Red Bull ring. In third position, the Maserati goes through. Here comes Darren Turner. Yeah. Expect to see him do very well, Andrew. Yeah, Darren Turner's got past a couple of cars, I think. What a terrific performance by him. Snowy. Well, I think the bumper came into the pits there. Don't oh, yeah. think it came by. The number seven, I believe, that came into the pits straight away. Didn't well, spotted that lap. No. So, problems with Sean Lynn. There's the... Uh, Stone with ex Dan Lambert's car going through. But, uh, Down through Terre Rouge now and onto the run up to the Daytona chicane. Now, and turns up to a fantastic fourth place in front of Fiskins, Delara, and the Hart Courage. I think uh, David Hart has started that car. And then Ortiz, the uh, Bolivian guy in the uh, dome. And then it's Mike Newton having a good start as well. Mike Newton's up to. Uh, seventh place well there's another very good driver Tommy Erdos yeah was the mentor for many years for Mike Newton uh, Phil Bartlett the crew chief the legendary kick crew chief fabulous Phil Bartlett he's uh, there he's here still here yeah. still still going I'm gonna put my hat Aston hat on for a minute Johnny feel free to knock it off I know but right. Darren Turner Three-time class winner at Le Mans in the big race. Yeah. Just putting the Aston up into third. Yeah. He said he was mega yeah, in the wet. Mega. Just nipped down the inside of the Maserati, which is you know, a mid-engined, proper proper car, yeah. not a GT car, proper race car in that sense. But there he, and Darren Turner's yeah. just he's been reveling in these conditions. He's loving it. He's back to he's reliving his youth. Yeah. yeah so well, I, go on, John. In, into the pit lane early on for Simon Evans uh, in the number 99 Porsche. Also, the number 73, Gun Gunther Schindler, has uh, peeled off into the pits as well. Sean Lynn, as Snowy rightly said, Gunther's in another Porsche, by the way, another 993 GT2 Evo. It's a classic. Not sure what has happened with any of those. And we've had a wee spin as well for the number 13 car at Marshall's Pause 3. That's the entrance to the Dunlop chicane from memory. And so big slide by the Maserati coming out of uh, Arnage across the white line. This is still part of the public road, remember, and therefore the white lines will be very, very slippery. We've had 10 minutes of the 43, started behind the safety car, and this is wet, wettity wet, in a very wet way. Yeah, the Audi uh, R8 of Maris is just slipping down the field, just went down about... Maybe he had a spin, maybe he's actually stopped, falling down the order. I'm, I'm just looking, John, at the, the, yeah. the, the line of those cars there on the, on the time screen. Pescarola C60, Toyota GT1, Aston Martin, uh, and then GT9. Car. 
yeah. and a Gigi car. In front that's of the Dallara, the door. And that's taken the leading class as well because the Maserati is behind it. The Emka Porsche going straight through at the second chicane. The Felbermeyer Porsche <laughs> following, going, it. following it as you well. You always hear you commentating, Ron. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, I'm back in... <laughs> We're back 25 years ago. I've, I've just slipped back through a hole in the... Uh, space-time continuum yeah. so leading in classes is the Pescarolo is the GT1 no both class leaders Aston Martin leading I spin for the yeah. Audi that's oh, yeah. down at Mulsanne corner oh, right that's next why to the, he dropped yeah right next to the signaling pits Collard has pulled away a bit from Perodo it's about five seconds in front now so he's really getting into his rhythm here on our screen is the Pescarolo coming out of the final part of the for chicane and across the line it's going to be somewhere in the region of five or six seconds and indeed it is just on five seconds so the first lap of 418 for Emmanuel Collard and Manu then getting the grips literally as well as metaphorically with these tricky conditions with still just over half an hour to go then the Toyota GT1 then the Aston Martin then the Dallara, that's the Gregor Fiskin car, the number 58. Then the Dome, and they're all battling in class, by the way. So the Pescarolo is the leader in LMP1B. Then it's Dallara, Dome and Courage, second, third and fourth in class. Uh, they're having a cracking bat between them, battle between themselves. In the GTs, it's the Aston Martin third overall from the Maserati MC12. And another problem for the Audi, ah, no, that was I how it ended up. I think he's just gone, he's gone the safer route to now. get it he's, facing the right way. Yeah, yeah, he's gone yeah. contra race to come back and back around rather Safely than Safely and wisely, yeah. Mike Newton in the number 25, Netview machine. He is running at the top of LMP2 in 10th position overall in GT2A, the 993 EVO, Sebastian Glazer in 13th overall, that's the number 22 car. The Riley and Scott leads its class uh, down in 16th overall for Xavier Michelon. All these cars putting in fast times. Yeah, Collard just put in the fastest lap, 4.18, so you know the, the track is wet enough that we've lost 25 seconds, I suppose. Which, you, which is exactly yeah. what you would expect nowadays yeah. as well. Well, here's a Bentley in the pit In the pit now. lane. Yeah for the Bentley, and the good news is... It's going back. The yeah, V8 back. engine has started. Slightly hampered in period, of course, because it was a closed-top car, had to use narrower rear tyres. Yes. And so they were always grip-limited on the back end of those that, cars. That was the rules. Yes, that was the regs. Yeah, 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 it was the regs. If you had a closed-top car, it was generally thought it would be aerodynamically more yes, efficient. Yeah. Um, and let's not forget that Audi tried both versions uh, when they came in 19... 98, 99. Yeah. Gee, um, I'd forgotten that. Yes, I'd forgotten they it. They ran the a over yes. top car and the R8C. And amazingly, the Japanese guy, Fashida, who set up that business, RTN, is here racing this weekend. Is he? Yeah, at 77 years old. He was, he was the guy that set up the Thomas factory, which became the Audi, and then subsequently was involved in building the Bentleys at RTN. Yeah, correct. Absolutely fact, right. Japanese guy is here. Uh, under half an hour to go, the site of the, as it would have been their Millennium Yellow before it was termed Velocity Yellow of Corvette coming yep. down into the second chicane. Important. Into the Daytona chicane, excuse pit, me. Pit window will open in uh, less than a minute now, so it'll be right. interesting to see who comes in early. So what they've done here is they've squeezed it down, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. I think we might see this race we might keep an eye on the timing screens, those of you following along. By the way, you can follow along livetiming.alchemelsystems.com forward slash Peter Auto, and you can follow along with the timing. We've also got a tracker on there for yeah. you as well, uh, and all the notice boards, everything that we've got in our global broadcast centre here, you can see courtesy of our very good friends and colleagues at Alchemel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all you do. It's, there's now not as much spray for Emmanuel Collard as he comes through the end of the Porsche curves and towards the end of the lap. Been racing so long, Collard. At one stage, he, he was on the list of, as a possible Tyrrell driver, he, uh, as a test driver for Tyrrell. And uh, he's only 52, even now. And he, he's never stopped racing, of course. Keeps him sharp. 
And uh, what, two years ago he did Le Mans John, didn't he? In the Penske um, Orica that they, they brought as a, a sort of a tease for, the, for this year. Good morning to Bruce Jones out at Spa. Uh, we've got, we had Spa weather this morning. We have. Uh, hello to Bruce and to Martin. Bruce tuned in. He said, name any car from any of the paddocks that you'd take home one of you, uh, uh, each of you, at least one car. And uh, would any of you chance the Citroen SM? I think I would. One of those cars yeah. that we saw. This, Bruce, it's an impossible question. I don't have children, but if I had, it would be like choosing between them. It is an impossible question. Yeah, for what's some, out there. Sometimes you have to. But yeah. I think what Bruce would do is ask Martin Haven, where's the Morris Minor Club here at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, and we yeah. haven't seen one. Well, we have seen some extraordinary old British sports cars, haven't we? Have we we saw two Lotus Sixes running together on the road uh, yesterday. Yes, we did. Two Lotus, not Lotus Sevens, Lotus Sixes. I'd never seen a Lotus Six before, and I saw two of them on the public road. Right, still raining at the far side of the circuit as Emmanuel Collard crests the rise on the Lin Duat Unadier. Now, now Perodo has upped his pace, so he's lapping only less than a second slower than Collard now, which is impressive. And uh, would you want to be in a closed or an open top car? There's the yeah. question. Pit lane is open. That it comes to Courage, yeah. the heart and heart car. That's David climbing out, his son Oliver climbing in. Perodo through the Daytona chicane with slightly less sheen on the road. The Festina Viper heads off down towards the far end of the circuit as well. And that is coming out of Arnage and into the Porsche curves. Something just brilliantly bonkers about <laughs> a company the size of Chrysler taking a road car that was never meant to happen and have a roof and making it, a, putting, giving it a roof and making it a ra race car. Spin for the other Aston Martin in close company with the Harrods McLaren going into yeah, well, it's the Dalmas is in that Dalmas in that car. Oh, there's the spin, look. Dalmas yes, in that really car, obviously, yeah. he drove the black Uemo car when he won. This was the car that uh, Justin, Derek Bell and Andy Wallace almost won the race in. Came third. In the end, after he gets some gear change. 127 yeah. Aston DBR9 from 2005. It's got Nicolas Ditting at the wheel. The owner, of course, uh, that will uh, change pace a little bit when uh, Ollie Hancock gets in. The, Roberts, the Robertson uh, GT40 in the pit lane for its mandatory stop. Now, if the driver doesn't get out, they've still got to serve the same amount of time. And I wonder when Manu will come into the pit lane. There's still, there's still a rooster tail on the far side of the circuit. John, they've uh, also shortened the pit window now as well, because it was uh, brought oh. into right eight minutes, of which there's only six and a half minutes yeah. left. So they've reduced that whole thing. So a much shorter pit window for this race. I, I know these are classic cars and they're worth money. But Manu, I mean, he's not on the ragged edge by any stretch of the imagination. Awful understeer, awful push yeah. there through Arnage. But he's, he's not frightened to slide them around a bit. But a Porsche on Porsche action as well, coming through Turt Rouge, the MK car. That was the car that uh, missed the chicane earlier on in the race. That's the Steve O'Rourke car in period. Yeah, the late Steve O'Rourke, wonderful man, a manager of Pink Floyd. Oh, so oh Mark off spin. Yeah. That is at Marshall Post 20, so that's at, uh, that's at Mulsanne Corner. And that's a big car to get turned round. You've got a long bonnet to look over there. I think that was just, just a down, going in, isn't it? Yeah, downshift. Going in. Sorry, that's, uh, that isn't Mulsanne at all, that's Arnage. So that isn't Marshall Post 20. Stephen Keating at the wheel. No relation. You mentioned Stephen Rourke. Um, I'm going to test your skills here now. Might be Pink Floyd, he managed Who else did he manage? Ooh. Meantime... The Lola B2K40, the number 90 car in very French blue at the signalling pits. Now that is at Marshall Post 20. Yeah. And that's quite awkward position across the track there because he's 90 he's degrees across no on the right hand side. He's got no lock, you say, John, to get it around to. He's got to get the engine fired up and engaged and, and drop the clutch and, and rotate it, or you can have an issue for it. Uh, through goes Collard. Now, what he doesn't want now is a safety car because he's only got five minutes to get into the pit lane. That's fine if he gets a relatively clear lap. I suspect that Francois Perodo will come in this time around. Another spinner, that is well, the number four, Xavier Micheron, Riley and Scott, that's gone around at 
uh, at Arnage. Yeah, Xavier's another, they, it's like Joe Bacari, trades and tops with good racing cars through the Ascot collection, but uh, losing, we came in far too hot, didn't we? Yeah, Xavier Michelin driving that car, the pedaling the car at the moment, and uh, going to hand over to the, soon to be named, uh, Aaron Scott, no connection. Yeah. But uh, Aaron Scott, Dave Scott's son from... Uh, Raced a lot from, here, yeah. yeah. Raced a lot here in, in period of the day, and the Morgans and stuff with Keith Harvey. And Ferraris as well. And yes. Well. So, so did... Right, Darren Turner's pitted, which he, he would have had to do, because it would have been too tight next time around. The pit window closed in four minutes. So anybody who hasn't pitted behind... So Olivier Galland has gone through in the Pianos Esperante. Uh, who else has gone through? No, I think everybody else has come in. I think Galland... Gallant is going to be struggling here to get in before the pit window closes. So keep an eye for the silver, the Vistion car, as the Marcos is uh, hobbled and heading into the pit lane that had spun earlier on. Mike Newton will not get out of that car. Phil Barker, the silver-haired Phil Barker now, standing to the left of the front of that car. There is a team, uh, there is a driver change the Audi spotting there. for the triple three machine as Eric Maris has looped it at the second chicane and the yellow flags are out for the Infineon Audi number three. This is one of the R8s. Yeah, so the uh, top ten looking a bit strange at the moment oh, with a few people staying up. Uh, uh, Gallant's not the only guy that, that might be uh, risking it here. I totally agree. Uh, the, um, the guy in the 50 Porsche 996. Anybody who's gone through now, so that includes uh, my, um, Michel Fauveni in the number 50 Porsche, the Lola B0540, the 2005 car, which is Pierre Luc Bosch, the 39 car, Nicholas Dittig for the Aston Martin DBR9 2005. Uh, that's the 127 car that had that wee spin. Mr. Steele, the Ferrari 430 GTC uh, Evo. Um, that car is going to be struggling. Mr. Steele sounds like somebody's history teacher, doesn't it? it does. I'm just wondering, John, if Collard will have to serve a longer pit stop yeah. than Perroda, because he's a fully professional racing driver. Yeah. Good point. Francois is not, and, and that could change the order. Uh, yes, because he's only 12 seconds, seconds behind yeah. right it's, now, and if it's a 20 second longer gets, stop. Yeah, we'll be monitoring that. that. At RSL underscore studio. If you want to get in touch, a number of people making the point to how expensive these cars are. But they are racing cars. And do you know what? I love seeing old cars moving. I love seeing old racing cars moving. It is a tribute to the engineers, to the designers, and to the manufacturers that they don't just sit and get dusty somewhere. I'm just looking at the top 12 here. 12 different manufacturers. Unbelievable. That's a good point. <laughs> so I think we've got two Aston Martins in oh, there. Oh, two now, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's changing all the time. So here comes the leader into towards the end of the lap. Live coverage from the Endurance Racing Legends event as part of the Le Mans Classic. Not one of our grids, our plateaus. Collard looking down to remind himself where the pit lane speed limiter is, I'm sure, because he drives so many different cars. He's hit that fine, and he'll come in for his pit stop with a yellow flag at Dunlop, which is just cleared. And here comes Perodo. That is so evocative as the red and white number one comes in, slightly dirty, little bit of brake dust on it, little bit of dirt on it. You, you say that, John, when we showed that opening the shot of it going over through the Dunlop Bridge, the camera was the other side, we, we treated that, that little view of it. And I just went back 25 years watching that GT1 go over the top. It was it was quite extraordinary. The two of them in the pits together now. Closed car, open car, uh, obviously the open car. A little bit easier to get in, in egress from, shall we say. And not think the man Collard's going to have to, but uh, uh, a lot easier than these closed cars. And it never ceases to amaze me just how tight those cockpits are to get into those cars. You've got to be, you've got to be real snake hip to drop yourself down into the seat in those. I've got a stopwatch running on the Pescarolo. And we'll see how long it has to stay there. No tyres for either of those no. cars. They've bled a little bit of air out and checked the tyre pressures. We're waiting for Gregor Fiskin to come in in the Dallara. He's in the pit lane now. Philippe Ortiz will be next. He's in the, and the pit window's closed. 
The pit window's closed, so I think Philippe Ortiz just got in in time, but everybody after that, so as we suspected, Olivier Gallant, and unless it is the lap at the end of the pit lane closing, these guys are going to be out of time. Collard's rolling. Well, the train, he was stationed for him one minute and 12 seconds. Right. So it is the full pit lane that will count. Yes. So here's the Pianos into the pit lane as well. There was some issue for Collard there because they were gesticulating, looking yeah. at the dashboard as what was going on with that car. Uh, and omnipresent was Omri Pascarella. Still yeah. overlooking it. Yeah. It's, it's my car, it's got my name on it still. His presence will have fixed yeah. that. Out behind the Aston Martin number 57 for the erstwhile leader of the race. I think he's held on the lead, actually, because everybody else behind is going to yeah. have to come in. Uh, Darren Turner is on his outlap. He's not come round yet, but he's going to vault up again to the sharp end of the standings. So when it all shakes out, the PlayStation Matmut Lessart car, Lassart car, excuse me, is going to be back in the lead with Collard with that distinctive white, blue and yellow helmet that he's had for all of his career, yeah. will be back in the lead. Absolutely, John. Just about to uh, pass a TVR. We've just got 16 minutes left, and uh, we cycle through, and Turner is now showing in third place. But the gap between Collard and Perodo, eight seconds, pretty well what it was before. That was 12 seconds uh, when yeah. they came in the pits, so there was a little bit of a difference yeah. in the pit lane. The Hearts are in fourth now, the Dome Ortiz is in fifth, and then Gallant in the Esperanti, but will he get a penalty? People are being penalised for speeding in the pit lane. Yeah, quite a lot of people being uh, penalised. The, the pit lane speeding penalties are commensurate with how far yeah. over the speed limit you are, so 60 seconds, 90 seconds. That will be added on at the end of the race. They're not going to be asked to come no, back into the pit lane. You're have to watch that, aren't we, John? Oh. It'll, it'll correct as yeah, soon as they go through the line. Al Camelo, excellent at that. Just on 15 minutes to go, then. And Darren Turner, indeed, confirmed in third position and some half a minute behind the two prototypes ahead of him. Absolutely the star of this race, isn't it, Darren? So, I, I ex you know what? The biggest compliment I can give him, Andrew, is to say it's exactly as I expected. Yes. And these days, of course, he drives all kinds of Astons. I saw him at Donington earlier in the season racing a 1935 Aston Martin. I don't think he was enjoying he's, it. He's a he, fellow, he is this weekend. He's racing LM, LM4. Um, he, Plateau 1. He's a fellow Turner owner as well, I believe. Um, no, he sold it. Did he sell and it? And do you know, the story was that he didn't even know a Turner sports car existed. I told him about mine. He said, I've got to buy one of those. He bought a nice racing car, raced it at Goodwood and uh, subsequently sold it. Um, and uh, Bar uh, Darren, of course, done a great job with his simulators, base simulators. I think they've sold it now, have they? Base performance simulator. Base performance. Uh, he, yeah, well, he's, he's, still, he's still got a minority share in it, yeah. but it's... James Guess is running it now, yeah. isn't James Guess is running it, and uh, Simon Rose of Feathers Motorsport, uh, they're running in GT Cup at uh, uh, Brands Hatch this weekend, I think it is. But, uh, well. I, my point is, Darren did a fabulous job with that. We did. We know, that came back because when he won the BRDC McLaren Autosport Driver of the Year Award, yeah. part of his gig there was to develop simulators for McLaren. Yeah. And that, that was his main role, as well as being a you know, test driver. And he was, he was early into the market. And I, I've got to say, I, I've used BPS in the past when I, I've been jumping in and out of, of cars, mainly because, A, I'm not very good at driving race cars. I never say I race race cars, I say I drive them. Sometimes I even drive them in a race, but I'm not necessarily racing. And, and because it's almost always a different car, a different track, and mostly tracks I've never driven on. And an hour or a couple of hours in a simulator makes your first time out. You've got to take it sensibly. It's not a video game. You have to take it sensibly and work with the engineer. And Darren's got some very, BPS got some very good uh, uh, engineers in the control room. And that means when you get out on the track for your first practice laps, and inevitably, if you're sharing a car, you'll not get a lot of time. It means that you're dialed into the track and you can use those laps much more profitably. It's, do you know what, guys? It's starting to dry up through the exit of the Porsche curves and into Corvette curve. End of the lap for the leader, a spin for the Maserati coming out of Mulsanne corner. 
John, you mentioned there that uh, these cars shouldn't be sitting in museums and uh, they may not be on the ragged, ragged edge, with these conditions making it a little bit more uh, easier to do that. And Emmanuel Collard there in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the leading uh, Pescarola, just coming through the chicanes at the end of the lap there. And mid-corner, it had a, a, a more than a twitch, shall we yeah. say. He, of a he had to catch it, shall we say. He knows oh. that... Perodo's laid it down now, gentlemen. Oh, yeah. uh, he's really starting to push on. He had a nasty little twitch going up the hill yeah, to three, the first three, part of them. One seconds between them. Uh, so there's, there's certainly a, uh, either a gentleman's agreement or a friend's agreement here to make this a little bit more interesting. But Francois, last time around, uh, had a, a lap of 5.56 against a 6.05 from Collard. But that car's, that Toyota is moving around now yeah, as he's on the first part of the Mulsanne. You can see him now again. Uh, V8 engine in that Toyota, 3.6 twin turbo, making a lot of horsepower. Now, John, you were talking about uh, if you don't make the pit window. Um, just looking through the rules here, there's a few cars we've done for speeding, nothing that's affecting the front of us, but uh, if you don't pit within the pit window a lot of time, it is a... No, five lap penalty. Well, okay. oh, well, so well, may as well be disqualified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five laps around here. You know, what we're doing? What's the fastest lap time at the moment? Uh, six minutes, uh, four minutes. Oh, yeah. 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 So, but we've only done five laps, six yeah. laps at the front of the field. So, and that is going to be mighty at the front of the field. Emmanuel Collard, with a less wet line, and we're going to call it again, staying on the wet weather tyres that. It, on yeah. which he started the race into the second chicane. He's got Porsche traffic ahead, two GT2 cars, and here comes Francois Perodo behind him. 11 minutes to go. Now, this was the wetter part of the circuit, and he pulls offline to overtake, and that is still quite wet offline. So he must be thinking, I shouldn't have taught, taught Francois so well. It's closing up on him at the moment. In the Collard in the car, he's won a lot of races in. A lot the uh, pre-European Le Mans, so the old Le Mans series they had in Europe, and uh, which started think, here, of yeah, course. Yeah, and I think they won. He won Sebring 12 hours in this car as well. Actually. That Le Mans series started here. Yeah, but on the Bugatti circuit, I didn't know that. Now here's, yeah. Yeah. here's the yeah. little bit of a theatre for you. Francois Perodo is a gentleman driver and a gentleman unquestionably. Oh, smiley face man. He's Lovely. big, big mates with Collard in front. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. But this is racing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, what's going to happen? Because it's inevitable with, what, exactly 10 minutes to go, as I say, uh, on the clock, that I think uh, Perot is going to catch Collard's yeah. Pescarola. It's, it's what happens of, it's, then? It's sort of like playing golf with your it's boss, like, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you can't beat him. Well, I think uh, Collard may be able to hang on here. But all the time, Perodo is learning about this car. We haven't seen this car in 20 years. I think that's a very good point that you make there, Andrew. I don't know how much testing he did before um, he raced it here, but he's doing a great um, job. Th they, they aren't contemporaries in terms of the cars on the track. They, the Toyota was well finished by the time they, yeah. the C60 came along. But, but my goodness, what, what a beast. It looks like, I always thought that the, the GT1 Looked like if you paint the black, it looked like it should have been attached to yeah. a hard point but of a fighter. Toyota had about five times the budget of Pescarola, oh, yeah. if not ten. It, at the time, they said it was the most money that anybody had ever spent on Le Mans. And they were desperate to win Le Mans. Remember, Mazda had won Le Mans. No other Japanese manufacturer had. Of course, fast forward down to the 2020s and so on. Toyota dominated the race until this year. But they're they're, they're only five years apart, aren't they, these two? Yeah. yeah. In age. Different, and, and in different fairness, roles. completely different rule set. Uh, pit stops are under investigation, as we pointed out to you, as we said they would be. Yeah. And with eight and a half minutes to go, the chase is on at the front of the field. So we are getting a battle. We'll check in with one or two of the other cars down through the field. A couple of Ferrari 550s running together. Uh, the 55 is one that has a uh, pit stop infraction and that car uh, running well down the order at the moment for Michael uh, Matthew Holborn. But 15... Uh, no, that can't be the right car. So that's a Tuscan. My apologies. Well, the timing and scoring at the moment showing an LMP2 Lola B05 in third place. Which is the 39 car, yes. Um, 
that, now, now it's cycled back down. Now that, yeah. They've taken that out. Yeah. And But it is showing that the Hart garage, now with young Oliver Hart, Olivier Hart, I did ask him, he doesn't mind, he said. <laughs> call me Oliver, call me Olivier. Um, He's moved past Darren Turner, so Darren's out of the top three now. So two Pro Drive Ferraris running in lockstep. Oh, great. They look fantastic. The original 550s, of course, were built from, um, pretty much built up from crash broadcast shells yeah, yeah. because Ferrari didn't really want to know. And I remember uh, David Brabham driving one, the Cooper's Brewery car, yeah. which was a very early car. And that was at the Bahrain GT Festival, which actually was one of the uh, precursor events before Bahrain was allowed to have the Grand Prix. We did an F3 event, and uh, uh, in, in which, interestingly, one young Lewis Hamilton did his first F3 that weekend as teammates to Paul de Resta. Well, also, Spin, that one of the Ferraris has gone oh, yeah. around. This is the number 62 car, which is Nicolas Joffre in a 550 Marinello. That's one of the yes, four drive not, cars. Not it face, oh. it, turn it around. Where's reverse, track. Pete? Where's well, reverse? You can't find yeah. it, can he? Yeah. Quite clear. He's got it stepped across the track now. He's got the left-hand lock on. That's fine. He obviously can't find reverse gear. That's going to be uh, absolutely prone sitting where that is. Remember Colin McRae, of course, racing here in one of these 550 Pro Drive cars. Yeah. Oh. Anthony Davison as well. And Connor's having a, having a little bit of a bit of a power slide to get past that stricken Ferrari, which is on the edge. Think the Toyota got, as well. Toyota got held up a bit then. Danica Patrick raced uh, 550 as well. She did. And yeah. Petit Le Mans. Yeah, she did. Just under six minutes to go. <laughs> Welcome to all of our yesterdays uh, here at Le Mans 2023. 11th running of the Le Mans Classic. Uh, we're celebrating 100 years of the world's greatest motor race. And at the front of the field, two cars separated by, what, half a decade, really, are five seconds apart for Manuel Collard, Francois Perodo, then the second of the Courage C60s through the class leaders, Darren Turner, inevitably, I think, as it's drying up, has been caught by some of the prototypes. He's dropped down to fifth, but is still uh, leading in his class. And yeah. other class leaders, Xavier Micheron for the Riley and Scott down in 10th, that's the number four car. Mike Newton for the LMP2 leader in his Lola EX257, the MG. Um, so Matt Hunter was enjoying the uh, Hot Wheels sponsored car as many of you are. Uh, Sebastian Glazer leads the Porsche class in the GT2 category in 15th. And, uh, yeah, GT2C led by our old friend Pierre Arret. Uh, yes. Owns a, a winery or two, I think. Yeah. Uh, Heiko Ostmann leading in the Invitational class. Scooter Gable is out in that BMW GT. 2000, yeah, that's the GT2B leader. And I think that's all of our leaders. It's only fair to give them uh, due honour. I think you're right there, Andrew. The Toyota may well have lost out. Just, uh, Francois Ferrer may have lost out. A little bit of time on that lap uh, with that uh, uh, first while Ferrari across the track. It's for, well, it's 4.1 seconds across the lines now down the way. He was again. very quick in sector three. Yeah. In fact, that was the quickest sector three of the race this is francois perauda we're oh. talking about and into the wall have we got the damage from yeah. the porsche yeah here we have at mulsan corner spins it on his own oh yes the number 12 car and that is such a shame for the bright yellow yeah no, number no, 12 no. for enrique uh, jemperle he was running in 10th in gt2 and that beautiful canary yellow car will require some remedial work and that has put the double yellows out at Mulsan Corner. Just revel in this wherever you are watching or listening around the world on RS1 for the audio. And we've also got video at RadioLamont.com as well. There's a special page there with all the links for today and tomorrow's races. Lots of traffic, isn't it, for Collard and, and indeed uh, Francois Perodo, the uh, man who's got all those oil drilling wells. I think Perodo's slightly more circumspect in the traffic. 
in a car that, yeah. as you've mentioned, Andrew, and I think this bears repeating, um, we've not seen this car race for a very long time. I don't think it's raced since, since uh, they were here at Le Mans. Right. Right. Oh, that I don't think it has, no, no. And Francois, knowing Francois as I do, he won't have just dusted this off and sent it out. He will have had it all prepped. Yeah. It be absolutely nut and bull perfect. Oh, slow zone now. So we wouldn't have had this in period. So slow zone, Perot was made up a bit of time there. Yeah, I did. Into did. the slow zone. Down to 80 kilometres an hour. Now, this is from probably half a dozen marshals pulls back from Mulsan Corner. This is the slow zone five. This is instead of putting out a safety car, so basically we've neutralised part of the circuit around about three-quarters of a mile. Interesting, oh. John, uh, uh, race control messages uh, for the number 62 Ferrari, uh, Nicholas Joffrey, to report to uh, race control immediately, as well as the team manager yeah. to both of them. So that, I think that's for getting that car part stranded and then not recovering it properly. Spinning it round is the right thing to do if you continue it and get on its way. Yeah. When you stall it part way across the track, that's what's called the slow zone now. Yeah. Well, that's this I, now the portion. I, I'm right. wondering whether they're going to make it to the line before the chequered flag falls, because we've got one and a half minutes left. So the slow zone ends after the Porsche. Yeah. There's a green flag about 50 metres up the road. Collard's back on it again. I reckon he'll, he'll get past the flag before it's the well, line. He, he, he wants not to, that's the point. He wants not to, he's <laughs> yeah. got his mate right behind him. Um, win the race at the slowest possible average speed. And don't beat the boss. Well, <laughs> I, think it's, I think he's been given some kind of uh, carte blanche here. Past the, the Cadillac engined prototype from IMSA, the Cannibal down into Indianapolis. One of the first parts of the circuit to be paved, Indianapolis, and gets its name from the fact that it was brick paved to start with and the fact that they put a bit of camber into that. That was going way back. Imagine racing the full circuit down to the Pont Lou hairpin, Pont Lou hairpin on gravel. Yeah, but also hours. But later on, imagine racing, coming up to the Porsche Curse, but going straight, straight past on. White House. Yeah, magnificent. Open tops, pro prototypes running in anger. Brilliant, says Blair Forbes. Totally agree with you. I was at the last, Johnny Palmer and I called the last LMP2 race with open top cars in well, Portugal. Time now yeah. says final lap, so this, this is, so this is not, going not, to be it. Whether he crosses the line with that time or not, this is it, it's going to be... Uh, this is it. So Emmanuel Collard coming well, out of the Porsche Curbs for the final time in the Courage. The Pescarolo C60 followed home by the man. I'm, I'm pretty certain Francois owns, owns that car. I would have thought so, yeah. I'm, so I was just, I was yeah. just speculating. I'm going to ask who owns the car. So, yeah. I think it's so, la his latest acquisition, I think. Our first winner of the 2023 Le Mans Classic with Henri Pescarolo on the pit wall, congratulating the team behind this car. And he'll be saying, just like the old days, eh? Yeah. As it goes across, a little bit of a wave from <laughs> yeah. Emmanuel Collard to his great friend and teammate for much of their contemporary racing. It is a win then for Pescarolo at Le Mans. Do you know what? I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> Again? I get to say that. Well, I, I say that at all, yes. And so the second place car is also a winner in class. So LMP 1B won by Collard and the Pesca C60. Then GT1A Francois Perodo. We're still waiting for the second of the Courage C60s to come around and has still not finished. They were well over a minute back yeah. and just four seconds between Olivier Hart and Gregor Fiskin. As they're coming to the line, our first and second are playing out of Turt Rouge. Great opportunity for some pictures from the photographers, which is being readily uh, <laughs> lapped up there as they go past the famous sign for the romp pod for the roundabout at the end of the straight. It's got to be the most used uh, scene of oh, hasn't it, ever? It is so, it is so iconic. And now, uh, Ellery there, just... Ellery, yeah. With Pesca down in the pit lane. 
Uh, Ellery drove a lot for Pesco in the past. Let's round up the results then. Third overall, second in LMP1B was the Courage, number 34, Olivia Hart. Then Gregor Fiskin in third in that class, fourth overall for the Dallara. Darren Turner um, bosses the GT category in fifth overall in the number 93 Aston Martin DBR9 from 2006. Uh, second in the GT1A category to Francois Perodo will be Olivier Galant in the Penos Esperante. I think he was late into the pits, so that might change pretty much everybody after Darren Turner in the top ten. Um, I think he's going to be out of time. So we'll do. I think Xavier Micheron is all right in the Riley and Scott. I think he got in. Mike Newton definitely got in, and he'll win his class, the LMP2 class. Sebastian Glazer for the number 22 Porsche wins his class. Also a class winner, Pierre Eret for the 430 Ferrari that we were uh, salivating over. That's number 190 car. They're still to come in. And there's two more class leaders, aren't there? Heiko Ostman was lapped but wins the invitational class of the 311-996 GT3 RSR from 2005. And finally, I think, Scooter Gable is in the BMW. The 2000, the BMW GT, the um, LMS car, which in the period ran on Yorkohama Day, as I've just remembered. Uh, and that those are your class leaders. Now, this not being part of our full Le Mans Classic Plateau, that is, a, I believe, that is a standalone race. Uh, it's not an aggregated race for the weekend. Lots of penalties, one lap penalties for pit stop infringements. Those are the people who came in yeah. then, aren't they? So, what about not car number 10? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Gallant will drop down. Um, any other leading runners there? They haven't put them in num numerical order, no. so... Uh, there's is the 101 in there? No, uh, I want to see. I thought... So, OK, so that he's going to be on. So there's going to be lots of changes. I heartily recommend you to go to livetiming.alcamelsystems.com forward slash Peter Auto, because not only can you see the live timing there, but um, you can pull up all kinds of results, etc. Well, top there. speeds and all sorts yeah, of great stuff. It's, it's all there. Quick, quick word for Sam Hancock, oh. rode that, uh, that uh, GT1 Evo 97 Porsche up to, uh, what is it, 10th, was he? Yeah, I think so. Uh, was that the Alexander Riedfeger car? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he got in that and really wrote, and, and also a shout out for Christoph Dansenborg in the uh, the other the Dorara there, the second of the Dolaras. Oh, the SP1, yeah. 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 Uh, that, I think that would be, if I look forward, uh, I think that might be a second position for that Porsche after the penalty for the Pernos. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Um, Unofficial at the moment. One thing we can tell you for certain that Emmanuel Collard has won, and in a very dry now, but I suspect still quite greasy Porsche curves. He comes back under control and will head towards the pit lane. Well, I reckon, Peter, that was worth waiting for. A little bit of a full start. Uh, give us a chance to look through some of the cars and bring out our remembrances. But uh, pretty much what we expected from the two guys at the front, because the cars at the front and the drivers at the front are, are among the quickest that we had in that group. Indeed, and a, a totally different cars at the front there. Mother Nature had a little bit of a, bit of a play with it, didn't she, to start with, uh, as she did uh, three weeks ago at uh, the main event. Uh, and didn't expect that. And uh, Emmanuel Collard's gone slightly the wrong way again now. She had to cut across the grass uh, there, just in the, in the pet Second roller. time he missed the pit lane it's entry. Second, exactly, she's done it again, yeah. But uh, uh, I think they go into, of course, they're going to a different place at the end of this race and he would not join the 24 hour. Disappointment for Bentley fans, of course. Jo Sean Lynn having that problem. He won this race last year in that Bentley. And Mr. John Abbey um, finished second last year. Well, he. He did finish the race, but he's 
right down in oh, the 20th position. So he obviously didn't like the conditions at all. And um, last year, Mike Newton was third, actually, overall. But I think a much stronger field this year, of course. There's going to be, I think there's going to be plenty of Bentley action for the rest of the weekend. Those, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, disappointing for Sean Lynn, of course, if you're involved in it. But uh, uh, there'll be plenty of plenty of action for him uh, later, or not, not for him, sorry, but for uh, Bentley's during the rest of this weekend. Um, we move on shortly to our, now obviously the calendar, the uh, timetable is slightly different. Our Porsche Classic race uh, yeah. com comes up next. And followed by some Group C racing. We mentioned uh, Olivia Gallant there, yeah. uh, John. He was a superstar of uh, um, the race last year when Andrew and I were covering it. The Group C race. The Group yeah. C race, yeah. Was, uh, I think he was second overall, wasn't yeah. he? He was the Silk Cup XJRs. Uh, so good to see him back out again. He's involved in the perfume industry, I believe. And um, was racing at the Goodwood Members meeting this year. I haven't seen him race outside France before. It's, it's a good strong run. So, one or two exciting moments early on, which has uh, resulted in, I think, about half a dozen or ten cars not getting to the end there. Actually, yeah, half a dozen is all. The Lola B9810, Alexandre Leroy, uh, didn't start, actually. Dominique Gunat in the Porsche, the Ferrari of Charles Scardini Jr., Gilles Petit. In his Lola, the Lamborghini Diablo, we didn't see. Uh, Valentin Simone, we didn't see. But I think the only car that didn't finish was the number 12, the bright yellow Porsche, the Henri Gemperle, the number 12 car, which rather clouted the wall at the end of the Mulsanne straight, or at least around the Mulsanne corner. I think it did quite a bit of damage to it as well. It wasn't just front and back tapping it, it had done the, the left rear suspension as well. So uh, it was definitely wasn't going to continue the race, but it's going to be a little bit more than a bit of tea cut to polish that out for uh, next, its next outing, wherever that may be. I think there'll be excitement for John coming up. We've got the Porsches next, and um, we could even have possible British success in the Porsche race, because I know that Seb Perez did qualify very strongly indeed. So we'll be seeing that in just a moment. Absolute heaven for John. Yeah. Porsche race, they put it on specially for him, didn't you know? It's nice. So the Sean Lynn Bentley, which was yeah. late on parade, is still proving to be a little temperamental as they come back to the pit lane. Well, that was a step back in time for me. I hope you guys uh, around the world, listening and watching, enjoyed it as well. What a, an appetizer for our full race weekend. Confirmation uh, of the results with the Pescarolo and Emmanuel Collard winning from the Toyota in second. Uh, third for the Courage of the Hearts, Gregor Fisk in fourth, Darren Turner fifth, Maserati MC12 in sixth, the Rip Vega and uh, Porsche, sorry, in seventh, eighth for Delara, ninth, the Riley and Scott, and tenth, Mike Newton into the top ten. Now, that is with the penalties being applied, so that did move that Porsche up in the second, as we thought it might. Uh, Sebastian Glazer in GT2 here, Pierre Arret in GT2C. Wow, that there's a lot of people drop way down after those uh, pit stops. Eichel Osman in the Porsche still wins the Invitational. Gerald Skeeter still wins in the BMW M3. In his class, GT2B. So that just changed some of the podium positions. And one or two problems towards the back end of the field. But frankly, and fortunately, very little carnage. No dam not much damage other than that uh, bright yellow Porsche. Which was excellent in, in those conditions. Um, yes, absolutely agree. Incredibly, incredibly tricky conditions to drive some of those cars in. Uh, Front of Perodo, a 4 minute 13.
1.2 gets the fastest lap of the race as a consolation of owning the two cars that finished first and second, but let his, let his best mate, shall we say, or one of his best mates drive the winning car. Uh, that Porsche number 12 now being uh, shoveled onto its flatbed, let's say left rear, if it's not the suspension, it's the wheel, certainly, that's broken on that car. That's not making that... A, it had a fair old clout with all, because it's a point of the track where there's, there's absolutely no... No runoff. No runoff. Well, it's not just that. There's, there's no conveyor belt in, no tyre, no anything. It is just pour con pure concrete, obviously, poured. Uh, so that, that's not going to do any good at all. Gary Harmon, good morning to you. Says, can you say hello to Chris Marsh, son of Mark's founder, found Gem? who drove the LM600 in 1995, and Nick Strong, who's driving the Marcus 1800 and Plateau 4. We'll get to that a bit later on. Steve Keating is driving the LM500 in that race we've just had, and all the Mini Marcus drivers. Are you a Marcus and Mini Marcus fan, Gary? I think you might be at RSL underscore studio. Wouldn't it have been amazing to have had Pescarola Sport win uh, this great race in period? Yes, and some how should have in, in terms of the cars rather than the rather than the man they just tried so hard didn't they yep. on a minimal budget really yeah totally uh, relying of course on british horsepower from judd yes uh, jason ford saying after seeing all those cars together i'm realizing i need more of them in the model collection ah. this is going to be expensive <laughs> <laughs> what scale? That's the question. It might be expensive because you, depending on what scale you 143rd. need. One forty third. Just go one thirty third. One forty third. You've got more space then, haven't you? Otherwise, it's an extension to the exactly. side of the house exactly. as well. Exactly. It becomes even more expensive. Yeah. Indeed. You build an annex to accommodate them. Well, what a great start to the weekend for us. Uh, a little bit delayed, but you know, worth waiting for. Things that are good are worth waiting for. The good news is that. The weather is clearing up. It's not cold and it's not being, it wasn't cold even when it was raining. The official temperature at the moment is 20 Celsius. Uh, the track, 20, uh, 23 Celsius. And the, the humidity, which was 94% when we came in this morning, has dropped down to uh, barely manageable 75. It'll be sticky in the cars, is something that to think about because all these are old cars, you still have to abide by all the safety regulations and the Bentley coming back on the end of a rope, Andrew. Yes, yeah, sad to see that. Uh, as I said, Sean Lynn won this race last year, didn't have any chance to show his uh, ability. What was he driving last year? Same car. Same car? Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. And of course, son of Alex Lynn, very successful British racing driver, and his younger son, Maxwell, is also racing this weekend here at uh, Le Mans. One of the things I absolutely love about this meeting is the way they lay out the paddocks for each of the uh, each of the plateaus year groups, and it's very very well done. It's curated beautifully. So just just close to here is is actually tier one, plateau one, and the four factory Talbots oh. are all in a line, and then next to them, but owned by different people. Are the, the later Talbots, and you can go around and you can look at DB Panards and see how their racing design progressed, and they're all next to each other. I don't know who does it, but they do it beautifully. Uh, also, in fact, even just in the car clubs, and there are over 200 car clubs yeah. here. I noticed in the French Porsche Club, obviously I was walking past that this morning, um, laid out in type order, and they are colour-coded, and what I saw someone with a clipboard walking up to someone who dared to park a Boxster in the transaxle part of <laughs> the thing, and that they were being, the finger yeah. was being yeah. wagged. I th I think you I get yourself back to the yellow area where you're meant to be with that mid-engine thing. I think we have to be careful on the cultural references there. I think we've gone far enough for that one. No, it was absolutely... It was, it was neatly done. It, it was done. absolutely brilliantly done, and th they were filling up early. Loads of... Uh, there must have been 600 people went out on track this morning in, in a variety uh, of machinery, but the vast majority was Porsches that were out there. And there was a couple of, I think there was at least one where there was, there had to have been a couple of hundred exclusively of Porsches out there. And there was pretty much one of ev everything and anything that you would ever have wanted. And so much around the paddocks as well. You are encouraged to dress smartly, but this isn't uh, a Goodwood. No. This, is, this is not a film set. This is people coming to enjoy what's going on on the track, 
there are plenty of things going on off the track as well, Andrew, but yep. it's a little bit more relaxed. The, it is. There is a competition for the best dressed person in period. Oh, but is it's there? not yes there is. But it's not a big thing as it is at Goodwood where if you turn up in, in modern pair of uh, whatever, you are frowned upon, aren't you really? I remember the first revival we uh, I put the radio in for it having done the radio for a few years at the hill climb and they said period dress it's 19 think about it being 1966 so I went in a pair of uh, cut off jeans and a tie dye t-shirt <laughs> pair of sandals uh, what, did, it, what did the one at any time but the Duke didn't think much of that it, was, it wasn't the Duke then <laughs> oh, no he was a, no he wasn't the Duke then it was um, the Earl of March then the, uh, and I think my Jaguar XK, uh, XJ40 was the only <laughs> non-period vehicle on the infield. Yes. Well, that, that and our broadcast truck. Yeah. I've still got pictures but of it. I think that's something they're trying to do here, John, and Andrew, as you've just said. I mean, I mean Goodwood's got a, something really quite unique, and, and the current Duke, is, is Grace, has made an extraordinary job of reopening that circuit. It closed in 1966 for, for safety reasons. The new three yeah. Formula One cars were deemed too fast. They didn't want to do it. So the place, the fact that it stayed derelict, actually yeah. played into his hands. Yes. Because it because it left it alone. It, uh, it was, yes. there, it was, it, it was his... there to refresh rather than rebuild, if, the, if you like. And the force of his personality. I mean, he had oh. had to do so much safety-wise. Uh, he, he he it, I mean, it is still absolutely. When I went, was taken round by Denny Harbin and McLaren M8. Um, can am car very very quickly it is exactly the same circuit the the, the thing about this event um, which in 2002 was nothing like how it is now but there was always a vision from patrick peter and indeed from the aco and pierre fillon has has underlined this in his program notes here um, is that anybody who thought that that this event was going to be a bit of a parade, a bit of a show from 2002 onwards and absolutely still, that is not the case. There's proper racing goes on out here. People take it, Andrew. Uh, we were talking about this in the, the Mazda CX-60 on the, on the way down. Yeah. People take this very, very seriously. And if, you know, classic and vintage racing is big business now. And if you're doing that and that's how you enjoy yourself motor racing, this is the big event of the year. But it's proper racing on one of the world's greatest racing circuits. Eh? Which is used precisely yeah. once every year and once every other year. Yeah. So on average, it's used one and a half times a year. Yeah. But you imagine the jitter is getting that done. But that, that, that yeah. was what I was alluding to about how this is growing. And this, this, this dress code, as you were saying, and some of the, the things you see, some of the vehicles you see, yeah. uh, the Willis Jeeps and the car clubs, etc. I, I, I get a feeling that this is growing more and more of being not just most fabulous racing, and I've got to say, the racing is just extraordinary. Grid full to cars we've got, but it's getting more and more of a feel of yeah. an historic Le Mans. Yes. Which it should be, it's his title, is Cla well, Le Mans Classic. And the, and the car clubs yeah. make this. Absolutely. The absolutely car clubs do. make Absolutely, it. they do. There's no well, doubt in my mind. Look, on Wednesday, when I was doing Midweek Motorsport on Wednesday, and people were saying, apologies for abs absence, I'm already on my way to Le Mans. There wasn't anything on track on Thursday. Yeah. It was, well, you know, with the, the cars didn't actually come out until yesterday. There are the most incredible French cars that oh. we've totally forgotten about. But then the one of the first things we saw as we were driving in was a Bondi Keep, for heaven's sake. I hadn't seen one for 30 years. What's that? It's a Bondi Keep. And, you know, if you're an enthusiast and you like cars of that era, you, know, you don't even know where to turn. Are there any Turners talking of that? No, it's Good not segue, a Turner then. to be seen. Not oh, only really? Darren. Darren. No, Pop no, Darren. No. <laughs> um, the, the Fairthorpe Club, um, for some reason, haven't participated. They, they run Turners. Um, Quick note from Benny Carrillo, who is... Now, where are you? You must be on the west coast of America, because he's saying it's 2.30 uh, oh. past that in the morning, so he's heading to bed. Love the classic Le Mans race. Really cool to see the cars from... Uh, across a decade or so racing together. And hello to Jan, just a quick point about the previous race. I absolutely loved the Maserati, if nothing else, because it reminded me of the sadly no longer existing GT1 series. I suspect there'll be people getting all kinds of old PlayStations out and playing the old games this weekend. I know Tom Aaron isn't here this weekend because there's a classic uh, touring car meeting at Brands Hatch. And he's got the, he 
bought about four or five versions of the old BTCC Talker game from Codemasters to be running on PlayStations at the weekend. Tom, if you, I know you'll be busy, but I'm sure you'll be watching this back. Uh, and delighted to hear, by the way, that we're going to get an, uh, a race named after your dad later on I'm, I'm this gonna, year I'm going to be entirely well. predictable, but, but GT1 cars were just fabulous. Well, you drove yeah, them. Were. You yeah. raced them in period. Yeah. Thanks. That, that ages me now. Yes. Oh, I saw them you in were period. Very young. <laughs> so you, you were very kind. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just in his late teens, yeah. Peter, when but he yeah, was racing. Vi those. Viper and Lister Storm and, uh, yeah. What needs need some list of storms out. Oh. Bobby, come on, listen. Greg, Gregor Fiskin's got it up for sale, but Bobby, get it out there, get it raised up. Someone demoing it, race it. Oh, yes, that's a good point. That is up for sale at the moment. Um, how do you like your flat sixes, everybody? Um, With a turbo on it. <laughs> many turbos, big turbos, <laughs> big triple fat. gear turbos. Bright <laughs> red. In a, that one, uh, red. One, one of the best glowing red at night. Stand to, to, uh, to, well, a lot of the different corners here, but particularly our nice and see the cars bursting away from you. And you can see the red turbos underneath glowing in a 935. And the race has started. Oh. The race has started behind the safety car. This is how we're going to claw time back. In behind one of the FIA WEC safety cars, the uh, turbo-bodied machine. In fact, that is a turbo. And let's quickly run through some of the cars. Emmanuel Brigand is on pole position in the 9.35 from 1981. Carlos de Casada, who we've seen racing in uh, Porsche GT3 Cup Challenge USA, has a K3 9.35, one of the Crib Brothers cars. Oh, yes. Pascal Duhamel is in the Group 4 9.30 Turbo, number 41. Then it's Guillaume Dumari in an RSR 2.1 from 1974. The enigmatically named Nelson, number 39, is a 930 turbo from 75. The 74, number 50, is Aguido Perfetti, well, well known uh, among endurance races, the Mentos Empire. Uh, he's got a, an RSR from 1974. Dominique Grinat is seventh in the 182. That's another 935, this time from 1977. Johnny Morland is racing in the number 52. He's a late entry, isn't he? I think that's William Paul's car. He has oh, been, is it? He raced it. Johnny last season been racing in um, the two, Porsche 2 litre cup all over Europe with uh, the Peter organisation. Yes, Will Paul's got one of those as well. Yeah. Is that where he met? I well? think that's quite. Well, I, I think he's maybe a last minute replacement. Right. Uh, speak to him regularly, he didn't tell me he was doing this, so a bit of a last minute thing. Obviously loads of Lamar experience. Um, so obviously that Perfetti and, and Johnny will be in the same class together. That'll be a decent battle. Uh, Felipe, uh, Felipe Colasson has a 1975 RSR uh, in, what's that, ninth position. The top 10 is Mattia Isidi. Another RSR from 1974, the 78 Cup. Just look at the other class leaders. Patrick Bonadel for the number 34 in 12th position uh, has an RS, 3 litre. Uh, Ippolito Pires is leading the GTP 1, uh, 11 class, excuse me, in 14th position, the 49. That's the 9046 Carrera. Mm. It's the low slung car that you can barely see uh, back. Uh, in, on the seventh row of the grid. Uh, Seb Perez is in a two-litre uh, Porsche from 65. That is a class leader as well, class pole sitter. Maxime Castellan for a 906 from 1966. That's the number 200 car in 22nd position. By the way, a, a barely acceptable 80 cars uh, in this. 2.3 ST from 1970, that's from Deschamps. He's in 33rd position in the number uh, 16 car. He's a pull sitter as well. And two more to come. Patrick Chapon has a Porsche 910 from 1972, the number 71 car, uh, down in 71st position. And Pedro Bethancourt in a 934 from 1978. Uh, and that's the number 73 car in 78th position. The pit window will open in 11 minutes and 11 seconds. So we started the pit window clock the moment that
that the cars rolled across the safety, uh, the start line for the first time. Uh, Peter Mackay, who's at home in Scotland, really needed to get him, got him in on this one remotely. Could have had him in through Skype or somewhere, because he would have been able to tell me nut and bolt details of every car in this race. It is a celebration of the Stuttgart brand, which in terms of road cars is 75 years old this weekend. Oh, sorry, this year. And... The Porsche 911 itself is a mere... a mere... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A mere infant at 60 years. That wasn't the word I was looking for. Six, but it'll have 60 to. next year, isn't it? This year? 63. I thought it was 64. No, 63. I thought it was the same as me. Yeah, not age. Well, it is, it is but let's get the year right. <laughs> So I think we're going to see some people pit at the end of this formation lap. Track is much drier than totally, it was. Totally a different venue, isn't it? Now oh, that. Uh, it looks like I appreciate those cars are gonna, aren't going to generate as much spray because the, the size of the tires. But all the same, it's there's, there's nothing. There's nothing. It's just a dry track. I, I've scanned so this classic Porsche race is all rear or mid-engine cars. There's no front-engine cars at all in this. So the safety car lights are still on as we head into Indianapolis, but it will come in this time around. Crowd beginning to find its way back to the track sides, even at the further flung parts of the circuit. Weaving around left and right to try and clean the tyres up as much as get any heat into them, accelerate and brake. Were you a weavy lefty righty or an accelerate and brake to get the heat in the tyres, Peter? A perfect combination of both. Of course. <laughs> I tell you what, you've got to be careful doing that because if you See when you should be zagging. Not, I didn't say at the same time. No, no, <laughs> absolutely right. No. There has been some great embarrassments down through the years with people flinging a car off the circuit. Because one of the things you, we, we said this, didn't we, uh, last time about talking about getting those heat into the tire, into the sidewalls of the tire, yeah. so that they're flexible. Because if you use any kind of curb or whatever, it can damage them uh, early on if they're not up to temperature. But one of the other things you need to do with, with the braking is, is you need to get the, the a lot of temperature into your disc if you've got discs or drum brakes if you have to use them into your braking system but that then goes down through the hub in through the rim and actually into the tyre as well so it's, it's dual purpose that's what you want to do rear wheel drive cars it's very easy just to leave a set of number 11 to get some heat into the rear tyres it doesn't usually get the right sort of temperature in the right way you want and as you say it, it is with a little bit of jeopardy uh, that you do that because it can suddenly snap right and all left and uh, you somewhere where you don't want to be. Carlos de Casada on the front row in the bright yellow orange car. That is the Whittington, the ex Whittington car. That one. That, yeah. In 1979 with uh, the Klaus Ludwig Kramer car, Whittington's paid for that drive with money out of a briefcase. The Road Atlanta sponsorship from when the uh, Whittington's owned what is now Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta and they sold it on to Randy Lanier who's got the circuit behind of course Lanier Raceway. You couldn't make it up could you? Yeah. Well there's a big story with their, their ownership of that but we won't go into so it I think now. safety car has got in for a full racing lap now 36 minutes on the clock or 36 minutes 30 seconds on the clock as we go there to new 2935s at the head of the field one of my favourite yeah. cars there Brigand and Cuesta uh, side by side up into the Dunlop curves for the first time. Uh, Carlos de Casada with plenty of experience of more modern machinery. Uh, the 935s 
Moby Dick, as they were affectionately known with the big whale tail on the back. It was good at Jeanette's first ever race car. And if you make your <laughs> uh, race debut in uh, a 935, then everything else is going to be a bit easier after that, I would have thought. The 235 then out through Turk Rouge, the Red Hill, and down towards Daytona chicane for the first time under racing speed with the pit window actually closing in five minutes. So I, I, I tell you what, I, yeah. I think I would have stopped at the end of that uh, first lap. Because you've got there to get are a shot on it. Yeah, there yeah. are some people. Eric Mouez in the number 79, 911 Carrera RSR, I think he's played an absolute blinder there because there's going to be a load of people who will not get back round in the time. Five minutes for some of these cars, they'll be a big ask. Yeah. Absolutely, John. Be interested to see what, how, how this pans out. I think they've all got to come, haven't they, at the end yeah. of this lap? Yeah, have to. There's going to be a big traffic jam in the pit lane, that's for certain. So the two 935s running nose to tail. Spitting flames, no doubt. Down to the second chicane. This is the left, right, left. The circuit will tell you that those are identical chicanes, the Daytona chicane to the second chicane. They are mirror images. And depending on which driver that you speak to, will tell you that one is tighter than the other. Yeah. Um, Drivers' opinions may vary. Who do you think? Mostly, I have to say that those, for those who expect a uh, preference, for those who said one was tighter than the other, they normally say the middle part of the second chicane is the tighter of the two. And I don't know whether that's just because you come in on a slightly different line, because you've been going more quickly as you get to the second chicane on that middle part of the Induato Nadir. I wonder if it's psychosomatic. It might be which side of the car you sit on. Exactly. <laughs> There are some people who are better on motorcycles at left-hand corners than right. Now, as a, as a teenager, I was always drawn to the, the shape of these 935s, which was... It, the, the doors on it are still a 911. Yes. But the bodyworks, all that... That, that was the think, rules, wasn't I'm it? I'm thinking the works one, of course, Moby Dick, of course, the yeah. Martini yeah. delivery. Oh, one. big lot up by Carlos de Casada in the yellow car, going into the left-handed portion of Indianapolis. Didn't seem to slow him down that much. The regulations were that the I think the roof line and the doors yeah. had to be uh, as per. So it's basically the centre section, wasn't it? Uh, but if you look carefully, particularly at the back of those cars, the original bodywork is still there. Absolutely. And the arches yeah, yeah. are built round the side of it. That was crew. Would that be group five? Yeah. In those days. And, and, and they used the original lights as well. They're right. inside the bodywork. Right. Right. So, but I, I, was, I was always drawn to that and the Zach, Zach Speed Capris time of how to take now what was talk. effectively a well, road car yeah. and just make it... It was on steroids, which we didn't know about this of course, or so other drugs available, apparently. Allegedly. Allegedly. Two, two and three-quarter minutes to go, and there's more than half the field have not yet got to Indianapolis and Arnage, and I think they're going to be out of time for the pit stop. It really... You really need... And I know it's it's going to spoil somebody's... Ra I haven't had a racing lap. Yeah. Yeah, well, OK, so in terms of results, it's going to spoil the results. But I suspect there's a few people here with still 30 yeah. minutes to go, Andrew, who, I think who so. are saying we're going to have a couple of laps before we turn the yeah. car in. The 79 yeah, Jägermeister car has played a blinder, oh, except it hasn't yeah, gone out again. Says he's still there. Yeah. So he obviously had a problem, so he wasn't playing a blinder. <laughs> just had an <laughs> issue. Problem, but good thought. I love seeing these 935s. But the, Remember, the leaders have crossed the line, they haven't come into the pits. No. Remember Paul Newman rating one of these? Here. 1979, finished second. Yeah, absolutely did it. With Dick Barber. Barber. Dick Barber. Dick, big yes. old Dick Barber, yeah. yeah. Uh, apparently that uh, number four car of Carlos Dick Casada is yeah. not the Le Mans winning car from 79. I've been told by our resident right. Porsche ex expert. Hello. Oh, you were the, hang on, there's, there's competition for the resident yeah. Porsche expert. I, I'm good on road cars. But quite recently, about five, six years ago in Sebring, uh, one of the Whittingtons suddenly reappeared mm -hmm. and with a brand new 935 K3. Really? Yeah, I've had it built. Had it. Appeared a couple of times and he disappeared again. No, just my point was that the first three cars have crossed the line without entering the pits at all from fourth, fifth, and sixth, and have now. But of course, we've only got literally one minute 
10 seconds left before the pit window closes. So everybody's going to get a penalty. So, so it's, going to be, it's going to be an organisation yeah. nightmare. Yeah, if everybody well, gets a penalty, no, it doesn't matter. Those, right. those, those starting it, I can understand a little bit more. If, if you start a race at set time under the organisers' stipulation, safety car, etc., how could you possibly complete the lap of time? If you chose to go past the pits, as these first two did, then that was your choice. But, well, everybody, but, do, everybody. but do you think do you think it might have been a typo? Because now on our screen it's saying ah. pit window open in zero zero, well in 38 seconds time. I think it was a typo. Ah, okay, it was ought to open, not, not to close. close. Yeah, yes. it, but yeah. Okay. Um, what? Shouldn't read what no, you believe. Quick question about the Whittingtons then. This is a racing question. What do we know about the Whittingtons and the Indianapolis 500? Three Whittingtons. Three brothers all raced in the Indy 500 the same year. And they weren't really single seater dogs. Bill, Don, and Dale. Were there, were there bags of cash involved again? I would have well, certainly would have been. I, 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 they weren't the only ones in that business. So, coming through now, we have the revised pit window open, which is just opened now with just under 30 minutes yeah. to go, which makes far more sense to me. So I, I think they've revised that from um, kicking it off when the cars went across the line. Um, wet tyres coming off one of the cars in the pit lane. I think that was the 2-1-2 that uh, came into the pit lane there. And, and that, that was the SC, the 1980 SC. Yeah, there was the 17 930 Turbo of uh, Philippe Corsan being worked on in the pit lane as well. That was having a tyre change as well, John. So some people obviously saw... The problem is you're sitting around for... A, those guys have been sitting around for a long time whilst the Legends race was going on. Yeah. I see our boy Molan's leading his class for the two-litre... These are the cars that's come from that, that Porsche two-litre series, haven't No, it? he's in a um, three-litre. Oh, he's in a three-litre? He's in a three-litre oh, RSR. Yeah. So he he's won't, in with, he won't so, have driven that before. So he's in... Um, the 930s in the same class as the um, 930 behind him and all the Carrera RSRs, Mathieu Itzi, Izidi, Kurt Thiel. So that there's a, a, a little gaggle of what's called GTS 27. Yeah. Um, first, second, third and fourth are all uh, on the circuit in relatively close quarters. Yes. Well, some great racing here, of course. Some he was doing decent times yesterday, Johnny, I yeah. noticed, uh, when he was out in that car. He's yeah. still got it. He oh, yeah, he's never still lost got it. it. He never, lost, never it. lost it. He's been doing a bit of rallying with some of his Red River Sport clients yeah. and enjoying that as well. I must get out with him um, next time he does a rally day. So the gap between first and second, just around about seven seconds, the Road Atlanta car in second place in chase mode at the moment. So now the pit window has opened and will close in eight minutes. Right, that. That's a bit more like it. Yes. A bit, bit, bit more got a, if it threw us off, then it probably threw everybody off down the pit lane as well. So. Just proves you never, never should believe everything you read. I suspect there was one or two people asking for clarification. Yeah. I think if you're doing timing and scoring, the biggest possible job in the whole world of motor racing is this event. Yeah, oh, so much stuff has to be keyed in. Uh, it, and I think that you know, timing people are doing a great job. Oh, second place, uh, Carlos oh, off going off. up to Dunlop. Off going up to Dunlop, Carlos de Casada has beached the Whittington car. He's not, not going out, out there. It's not coming out of there. And the K3 is, I'm a firm KO at the moment. Big lot up. We saw a, a wee lot up at Indianapolis. And Arnage last time around, he's got on the wet part of the track and he's not stopping it from there. He bounces across he, the first part of the kerb and, and then in the gravel. He might have had half a chance of getting yeah. out, actually, if he'd reversed slowly because there's a access yeah. road around the outside, but, but spinning it up, I mean, but that car's got a, a gear going, a light switch. Lift, well. Lifts the car, not sinks it as he well. Was, he was first. having that instant about three quarters back. He started three quarters back. Who was it who said he just got behind on the stage? So that has left then Emmanuel Brigon uh, with a 30 second lead back to Guillaume Dumari in the first of the GTS 26 class cars. That's an RSR Turbo from 1974. So we've got yellow flags and a slow zone now 
at zone one. Now, that's bad news for anyone behind that who hasn't pitted, because that is going to slow the run down to over the top of the... So, from the start line to over the top of the rise under the Dunlop Bridge, if that makes sense. I had a bit of over and under going on there. We've got the snatch tractor out, and that will haul it. It also looks terribly undignified, doesn't it? Uh, pit stop, and this might be a bit of a work of genius. Um, it's the 47, isn't it, to Carrera RSR of uh, Fernando Espirito Santo and Ricardo ah. Bravo. Got in and taking the opportunity to say, so it's not quite a safety car, but it's a similar principles of was an opportunity to get into the pits. The car that's in the gravel is from the Bruce Mayer collection from LA. The car that is moving gently out of the gravel at the moment. So now we're going to see a right old comeback drive, aren't we? From Carlos, if he refires the car, don't want to know where all those little bits of gravel have got to. Le Mans gravel is very particular as well. It's quite sharp. Leader already through Indianapolis. Nose of the car, the flat nose. Drops as he breaks for Arnage. Allows the turbos to spin up, pop and crackle, and other breakfast cereals. As, as, as my memories sort of flooding back to me yes. of course the, the, the group five cars we're talking about with these incredible arches and as we mentioned the, 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 the capri of course don't forget the bmws oh yeah works under the, 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 the 320i which yeah, was yeah. supposed to be which was you know, ronnie peterson driven those cars i mean with those fabulous alpina stripes that started at the front and went down the side um very much similar to the little storm in its day yeah that rake up to the side of it and those, those three those colors uh, very, again, very evocative, and I'm, I'm, ju I'm just wandering down memory lane. I should talk about what's going on here. No, at no, no, that's, a, that's absolutely what you have yeah. to do here, and that's the whole point. We've got the first podium ceremony going on as well at the moment, uh, which uh, is being celebrated on the start-finish line podium, but no time, I'm afraid, with the delay we had this morning for the rainstorm to... Uh, be able to give you full coverage of that, but there was a smattering of applause into the slow zone. Now that is carrying the leading car is carrying the stripes of Gunner Racing. Um, very interesting. That'll have to come into the pit lane this time around. We've got a technical. But it hasn't. Oh. That's a mistake. And I, th I think it's going to get to the slow zone now, John, where that number four. Similar car, the 935 was into the gravel, which I'd have thought would move by now. But, but he had the chance to go in. He, exactly, that's the, my point. He, he slowed down enormously at the pit entrance, but didn't take didn't take the opportunity to come I in. I think that's yeah. where, the, if yeah. from memory, that's where the slow zone starts. Okay, so that, that, actually, that, at the start fine, of the, of the Ford chicken. So, but why not oh, take the chance to go in? Side jacks. They're not as good as the NASCAR not boys the were Hendrick's the last boys, week. Now no. the Hendrick Motorsport guys. We've got the. Uh, very jauntily liveried Porsche ST in. And that is, see who brought that one in to the pit lane. That is the Jean Frank uh, Dirich. That's one of the two litre cars. Uh, Brigand's lots of experience, been racing um, mainly in the French GT Championship way back for, for well over 20 years. He's also raced in the VDV series, done quite a bit of rallying as well, so he's a very experienced guy, and he's handling this Porsche 935 brilliantly, I think. Well, he'd be better off on the gravel section, he'd done lots of yeah, rallying. Well, yeah, well, yes, I thought... The wrong, the wrong 935 went off. Yeah. Uh, my apologies, I got my 935s the wrong way around. The Le Mans winner from 79 yeah. is in the Bruce Mayer collection. In yes. House. So this, that wasn't the car that was in the... Uh, in the gravel earlier. Now, did it continue, is my question. Uh, and oh, people have blown the slow zone as well. Uh, I'm not sure it did. And that pit window is closing in a minute and 20 seconds now. You can have a lot of one-lap penalties here if that, is yep. the, if that is what we've seen in the past. 
is, uh, is held up. Live from Le Mans, this is the 11th running of the Le Mans Classic with over 800 cars racing this weekend, something like 8,500 additional cars on display around the circuit. If you can't get oh. here tomorrow, you can watch again tomorrow. We've got three more set, uh, two more sessions. Those are cars on display, but think of all the other cars that the spectators are oh, just coming. Absolutely. Three wide from three different eras, but all 911. One of the two leading cars in the middle, <laughs> the little dark green machine. Going through the big thir the big turbo with the back rear, the big rear wing, which is nice because you can have a picnic on that. Yeah. And, you know, if the car's warm, it keeps everything nice the, and toasty. The dark green car road registered. As I, I think they have to be in the... Two litre cup. Ah, oh, they quite possibly do, yes. Uh, carrying the number 59, which is the Brumos colours of the famous Jacksonville Porsche dealer and race team. Got a great museum there now, haven't they, Joe? Have you been up to it? I uh, was invited up there um, when it opened. Oh. And, uh, As you were. We were. It was opened around Daytona that year and uh, very honoured to be asked to go and say a few words and it is superb it was in the, the Brumos Museum was informal behind the dealership for many years a very anonymous rear warehouse building and um, Bob Snodgrass um, sadly deceased lovely man and um, Mr Davis his partner Dan Davis his partner um, well, Dan decided it was time that some of those cars saw the light, and I think that was a lovely thing to do. And it's been turned into a museum and venue. Um, so plenty of car clubs going there for that. And delighted to have been, and honoured to have been asked by Dan to go there and do some interviews at the, on the occasion of its uh, opening just before the Daytona 500, which we've got to be four years ago now, because it was before COVID. So the leader comes into the pits. However, the pit window window is closed. Is closed. Gunner Porsche emblazoned on the side there in that very typical Porsche script. Now, a moment or two ago, down at Indianapolis, I'm afraid, bad news for the number 82. That's again one of the two litre cars. Was that 82 or 84? 84. 84. 84. Yeah, for Steve Jones and GB. Um, you never like to see oil smoke from the oil and air cooled car cars. It can happen in two ways: something's gone horribly wrong, and it, or you could have overfilled it. Overfilling those cars with oil is as bad as underfilling it. Actually, possibly worse because you blow out seals. So here's the pit stop for the leader. I suspect it will be um, under investigation. So Dominique. Uh, Grinat has gone through in another 935, this one of 1977 vintage, the 182. He's not he, stopped. He's either. stopped. But no, he hasn't stopped. He hasn't been down the pit no. lane. And, uh, so Johnny Morlam's pitted. I think he's late as well. I'm trying to look down for the first person who's actually pitted in. I think, it's Patrick, car. I I think th it's Patrick Bonner down. Yeah. I think so. And then the rest of the people, long way back, that pitted. The, everything being looked at, the classic. This is the number 79 Jägermeister car we're talking about. Ah, the four car has got back to the pit. Yes, yeah, it was moving on the track. I was just making sure it was in sector two. I was making sure it was genuine, but yeah, it's made its way round again. But has lost a lap, presumably, uh, to the leaders. Uh, must have done. Well, that's interesting because it isn't showing on the timing screen at all. Oh, yes, it is. My apologies. Carlos de Caseda in the K3, 50th, but still third in class. All right, let's see how far up we can get. Five stud rims for some of the older cars, including the very uh, nice tartan green, number 18. Do you know what? Just go out and enjoy yourself. Never mind about the pit stop window. Really, I think that's what's going on here, gentlemen, if I'm brutally honest. And why not? As it should be. Well, I was going to say, why not? That's uh, Dimitri Plaquet. That's a 2.5, excuse me. That's an ST from 1972. 
Uh, and, ah, we've got the... The 906. The 906 off. was off at the side of the road there. Um, that is at... That's, that's between the two chicanes, is it? No, it's, be, it's after the second chicane and before Bultan Corner at the side of the road. It is at the cutout, though. That's a shame. I was looking forward to seeing that car going around. So 15 and a half minutes still to go. And you see, I think maybe the first 15 or 16 will all get a penalty job. And they were, oh, they're probably, most of them are probably in front of the guy, that, the best guy that didn't, that stopped well, at the right time. Dominique Gunat is leading in the 182, yeah. just going into Indianapolis and Arnage now. Has def I mean, he still hasn't come in. Nelson in the 930 Turbo. That's the car that's in the same class as Johnny Wallen. He's not been in. Got a 9146 in at the moment, which is the number 30. These guys are way out of time, but you know, if everybody we're down is it doesn't really matter, it's gonna balance itself out, isn't it? Yeah, that's basically what I was saying. Yeah. Oh the opposite lock on for the number 26. That is one of the two leading cars, and that was coming out of Daytona Chicane. Quite a lot of these cars wearing number plates, including the silver number 80. 8-0 on the pit lane for Robin Ellis in the RSR from 1973 with the classic duck tail spoiler. I love that. I'd have one of those for mine. I, I still oh, think it was the best looking That's a 906, isn't it? We saw on the side of the track. No, that's, oh, no, that's no. the 200 car. Oh, that is a 906. Car. That's no, Maxi no, no, Castellini. Yeah. Um, it was, I think it was the 908. 908, was, yeah, yeah, you're right. That was a single number as well um, on that car. I think that was stuck by the side of the track. Yeah, I've, um, by the way, the opening of the Brumos Museum was before the Daytona 24, right. Daytona 500, yeah. which I think slipped out of yeah. uh, my mouth when I was too busy looking at uh, Porsches and getting rather overexcited. Yeah. Only ever raced one Porsche. Have you raced a Porsche? Pretty you must have. FIA GT3 European nice. series, 997, with Tech 9. Nice. Yeah, with uh, some bloke called Tom Ferrier. He went on to do quite well, wasn't he? Rubbish driver, but great team owner. But, uh, I take it back, a good driver. I take it back, he was a very, very good driver. Don't Going we? to be running yes. Corvettes uh, in the yes. WEC, much trailed and announced. I'm not, I'm not sure I would talk to him anymore if he's not running Aston's. Well, <laughs> he's, uh, he's off your Christmas card list straight away. <laughs> Tech 9, um, Phil Hindley's. Phil Hindley, yeah. yeah. TVR Tuscan champion, yeah. Phil's on the world. Lad. Oh. Yeah. Pro but somewhere else boat. I must go up and see. Uh, he keeps asking me when I'm next up there, and you know, it's finding somewhere to go. Hello, Phil and the guys. So the leader goes through and dives into the pits, does not dive into the pits. Uh, it, it may be kind of to hell with it. I'm just going to keep on driving, I suppose. He's driving them on. Just was, yeah. Just want to stop. Oh, no, sorry, that's Brigant. He has brigand. stopped. He has stopped. Yeah. So He's that, stopped. Well, I think he was late, but yeah. it's not going to matter. It's all going to balance each other out. The question will be, how high up the field has the first person who made the stop, which we thought was the 34, Patrick Bonadel, he is he's three minutes down. So he's basically got to stay on the lead lap, and then we're going to have an RS3, um, three litre, uh, <laughs> from 1984, potentially win the race. Yeah, extraordinary. The, I think it's... Uh, in second place, Gunay and Gunay, I think at the moment it's Dominique. Yeah. They're a father and son combination, those two. Right. A lot of uh, family outings this yeah, weekend. Yeah, there are, absolutely. But we, we've got it, we don't know who Nelson is, do we? we no. That has completely foxed us up oh. in third place. Revel in the sound and vision of Porsches at Le Mans. Almost synonymous, really, in my lifetime. And many of you who are watching and listening, the 9.35 leading the race, introduced in 1976, based on the 9.30 Turbo. Group 5 rules. 
effectively came out of the old 2.1 turbo Carrera RSR prototype, which finished second in 1974 here at Le Mans. The 935 was offered to customers from 1977, and they lapped them up in the World Championship for mix, as it was known in there. It was a GT Championship, the DRM, Deutsche Rennsport Meisterschaft. And it won pretty much everything in its career here at Le Mans. Sebring, Daytona, 1,000 kilometers in the Nürburgring. Of the 370 races it was entered, it won 123. That, that's success, isn't great it? Great stats, great stats. It did, in fairness, it was of an era when no other manufacturer had anything really out there. So, you, you know, it wasn't the same car winning every week. It was that typical Porsche thing of, you know, let the customers race. And it would be a different customer almost winning every race. No, now hang on a second. Uh, the leader has slowed down, and the 182 has gone back into the lead on the road, I think. Yeah, so, absolutely, John, you're reading that correctly, I'm sure. I'm pretty certain the red, white, oh, yellow, France Porsche, the Emmanuel uh, Brigand, excuse me, the Dominique Gunat car, which came out of the pits in second. I think that's our lead car now as it heads into the Porsche curves. But the Brigand car has just done a purple for first sector. Mm. Sorry, as it heads oh. into Indianapolis, are not. But then it's slower in the second sector. Yeah, that's a very long second sector for the Brigand car. Yeah. Johnny Morland moving into view here in a different category of car. Now, he... How much less horsepower has he got than the two in front of him? Uh, quite a bit. Considerable. Half. Uh, at their peak, the 935s were running nearly 850 yeah, horsepower. Yeah. So that, got, I'll got. just say that again for those of you at home. 840 plenty horsepower. 845, 8 something like that for this car, which weighed, well, I don't know, 900 kilos, if that. 970 kilos, yeah. the minimum rate by the rules. I had to look that up there. So I think you could say that was adequate, and keeping the rear tyres under it was a skill. Uh, I'm just going to put this out here, John. Last year we had a surprise appearance in a Porsche by Nelson Pinkett. So do you think that's Nelson again? Well, it just makes me wonder. He does yeah. like his nom de cause here, doesn't he? Well, I mean, he, now, PK is a nom de plume anyway. Yeah. Because his, his name is Sutomayor. Of course, there is, of course, 935. Don't forget, we've got the uh, reiteration bit now back in, in 2019. Yeah. Based on the GT2. Based on the GT2, yeah. Non road legal, most cars. Yeah, because she had some of the 919 hybrid stuff, didn't it, on it as well? The, some bobs. There was a couple of people who took them up. Yeah. Bikes Peak was a couple of weeks yeah. uh, last yeah. weekend. Yeah. And uh, great marketing champion. Took one up, Pikes Peak in uh, classic Mobile One livery. Won their class. Uh, David Donahue was racing one as well more recently. On, on, on time trialling it up the, up the hill climb. Yeah. It's not fair to call Pikes Peak a hill climb, is it, when you start at 9,500 feet? I, I was going to say it's 13,000 yeah. feet or yeah. whatever the heck. Sorry, uh, you know, that's right, yeah. It's like, it's like suggesting you're going up everything, call it rambling. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm just going to. The walk of that hill. It is a hill climb, technically, yeah. but it's it's a it's a bit of a hill and plus. Don't they sound fantastic as well? All of these cars. The early 935s, of course, didn't have the slant nose. Um, they had normal headlamps. Um, but most of the ones we see now yeah, run the flat nose. And Kramer did other body work. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah and Kramer brothers. Car. So, a very unusual car on the way down, actually, when we stopped for Andrew to get his ice cream, <laughs> um, which was a flat nose 930 turbo, one of very few main road car, using the same pop up headlights as the 928 and 968. Oh, stopper on the track is the number 21. And 
squares that oh, hasn't just hasn't made it into the pit lane. That's very unfortunate. Detail or back from Germany. I think he's one of the, one of the two drivers anyway. Probably him. Yeah, running the RSR. That's a 2.8 RSR. Sunshine at Le Mans and Porsches. If Nick Damon was here, he'd be singing Dancing Cheek to Cheek. Heaven, I'm in heaven. He would, he would. I, you know, I, know, he would. I know you're absolutely right. I just, it would be. Absolutely born dry now at what was the wettest part of the circuit barely an hour ago. Yeah, the clouds have definitely rolled back. Sun now shining. Hopefully it's set for the rest of the afternoon. The air temperature hasn't changed that much. In fact, it's gone down a degree or two because I think the wind's picked up. Um, quite considerably, but the track temperature is climbing very quickly, 26 Celsius now on the track. As this beautiful 9.35 heads through the very quick, he's still on the throttle all the way through that first part of Indianapolis, the little left-handed. I, I was told off at Le Bon by Johnny Morland for calling that the little left-handed king. <laughs> he went, that's not a king, that's a corner. I said it's a kink because I drive so slowly. <laughs> a lot of uh, fun being had in these early moments of 2023. Still to come in this session, we're going to extend our morning session to ensure that we get the 40-minute Group C racing. Although we are running behind schedule this afternoon, Depending on whether we can get back on time, we will do the Bentley race, the Little Big Mans, and the first of the Platos, the earliest cars from the 100-year anniversary edition of Classic Le Mans. That's this uh, afternoon. Yeah, that will be a big battle between the Halusa boys and their uh, wonderful Alpha and, uh, and the Talbots. And we have had it added an extra hour, uh, extra two hours tonight. It was scheduled from half past six to half past eight. We'll see what time that starts. We'll keep you informed with that. Keep watching on the socials as well, because I suspect there'll be a little bit of rejigging to go on in terms of how the uh, how the races are structured in the timetable because of that big rain delay this morning into the slow zone the leader uh, ah, now 33 has made it back to the pits ah, not going very well this is Daniel Durant in the mid-engine car now that didn't look like it was going anywhere any pace, if I'm honest. It's the, that was one of the 910s, 1967 car. And I'm afraid that isn't going out the pits. And Daniel had his helmet off. When do you think that 910, Andrew, in 1967, that must have looked like it dropped in from another planet? Yeah, absolutely. Just Remember, see, uh, uh, 9.08 and 9.10, people used to race them at British club events. Yeah, yeah. Bill, a guy called Bill Bradley, a Birmingham butcher, was one of the great proponents in the 910. And, uh, and Martin Hone, of course, as well, and ran the famous Birmingham Opposite Lock Club. Oh, really? You never went to the Opposite Lock Club? Gas Street. He called it High Speed Gas Street. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, a great guy, Martin Hone, the guy who was behind the Birmingham Super Prix and a great entrepreneur, but a good driver in his Porsche back in the day. Oh, yeah, very good. So... Brigand is, is closed up a bit again, I think. I know the gap is 22 seconds, but he's just... just had three purple sectors. Oh, no, suddenly he's dropped back. He's pitted. He's pitted. Oh, his last, his second pit oh, stop. Final lap now, anyway. Just come on the time. Well, that's a disaster then for him. 
So that's sort of handed the race across the line at least. To the good age. Yeah. In the 9.35. It will be another class leader in second, which is the 9.11 RSR Turbo, the number 63. Then Johnny Morland wins his class in the RSR 3 litre. And the car that was started by Enrique Gemperle, the number eight, another 935, the 1978 car, will be fourth across the line. But I ask again, who's got a pit stop straight? Patrick Bonardel, who we absolutely saw in the pits before the pit stop window ran out. I think he's still on the end of the lead lap. And by the way, we're getting loads of speeding penalties as well. They'll be added on afterwards. Just as a wee footnote to the endurance race, uh, Perodo hadn't driven the car at all at, uh, as late as Daytona this year. So anything that, he's, that he did in that Toyota. Yeah. And he bought it from the previous owner because the previous owner thought it was too fast. Ah, oh, interesting. Mr. Mackay firing that ah. into me. I wonder who the previous owner was. Ah, uh, well. Maybe Japanese. Lots of penalties coming in for speeding in the pit lane. That's going to. 30s, 60s, and 90s. We've had the full compliment there. Yep. Just waiting for the leader to come round to the chequered flag. See young Mola be calling himself a Lamar winner now, won't he? Class winner? <laughs> Class winner in a Porsche? You see, you know, you, you, you could just mention that in passing. Class winner in a Porsche at Lamar. Yeah. And nobody would question that. And it would be correct. Yes. He didn't say, as long as he doesn't sell them on 24 hours, that's fine. I did take exception to um, one or two stories that are printed about various people who say my aim is to race at the Le Mans 24 hours and then when they've done the road to Le Mans or something like that yeah um, you know I've raced at Le Mans there oh hang on you dropped the 24 out of that here's your winner it is one of the mighty 935 twin turbos 1977 and the Gunats take the victory, it'll yeah. be about 90 seconds. Kurt Thiel followed them through in the very pretty number six, uh, 2.8 RSR. He'll be no better than third in his class. They, they run something called Equip Europe. Gunais, I was saying. Gunais. Gunais. Franz Porsche. That doesn't mean anything to me. That's obviously a, an original livery. Yes. I think it was just... You know, one of these things that... Uh, well, a few people bought, uh, had Porsche 925s. I, I have a feeling it was just a dealer. Um, um, as, you know, we, we talk about the Salzburg car and things like that. Yeah. second place car to come through and it will be the RSR Turbo the silver car with martini stripes coming through now to the Ford UK, this is the number 63 Dumari Guillem Dumari and slides that car gently towards the yellow and blue kerbs crosses the line Henri Gempel here in the 9.35, should be next up. Some other yeah. class winners who've gone through. Matt Holm brought the two-litre winner through. It was actually pretty tight in that class. There was uh, five or six, as we mentioned. Five cars separated uh, by round about 10 or 11 seconds there. So the number nine of Matt Holm from Christian Collin, the 53, David Danglard, in the 37 in third, just off the podium, Yevgeny Kirif in the triple one, and in fifth, Philippe de Crime. All in the two litre class.
Yeah, pretty nice show that was. Wonderful to see the 935s. Big shout out for Molum. I don't think he'd raced that car before. Great job to win his class and fourth overall. Just picked to the line actually by that second 935. You'd say incredibly underpowered car there as well. Yeah. yeah. Punching above his weight to say well, that. Well, a bit punch above his Johnny, weight. Yeah. Johnny, very experienced at Le Mans, most certainly. Uh, but it is, it's very different driving a an historic classic car at Le Mans than it is driving the things that Johnny's driven in period. Yeah. And he's not that old enough to, to drive in cars that were then his. No, he's very young. Uh, uh, yeah, no, he's very no, young, very too, way too no, young for that. And uh, yeah. no pressure, really. All his own hair as well, still. <laughs> well, I've got all my own hair, it's just a different colour now. Yeah. <laughs> and now come we snowy for different reasons. Yeah, well, absolutely. I've got all my own hair, but there's not much of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both of them. <laughs> Uh, here's the one lap penalties. Oh. Get the bingo card out. 3, 9, 15, 22, 26, Get the 27, bingo 20, card 33, out. 34, 37, 47, 59, and 64. Ah, so the 63 is not in there at the moment, but I suspect there'll be more than that. I'm not seeing it change on the timing screen yet which it will do once that has been assessed. So I think that is the result that we've got. 182 is not on that list. Oh, hang on, more. <laughs> hang on, hang off. 69, 75, 77, 79, 84, 125, and 2, 1, 2. Well, if they, now they have put them in number order there, so yeah. Alcamella listening to us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I think that the 182 is safe. Yeah, because lead. we've got a 212 there, so. Correct, yeah. exactly right. Uh, so, who's the highest placed car that got pinned? Oh, I won't know because I've been moved by now. So, let me just see where everybody has gone to. Let's do your class winners then, as we've now got those penalties in. Frank Deschamps in the 2.3 ST wins GS. GTS 21 in 34th place. That was the number 16 car. We mentioned that great battle in the uh, two-litre class, which now has disappeared from the time screen. Uh, so, Frank's there. Matt Holm, there it is. So, he won that. And further up the field, uh, Maxime Castellet in the 906. Porsche 906, of course. Um, was it a 906 or a 904 that won the Monte? Bizarrely. No, that would that would have been the 904. And it actually, it was a it was a podium. It wasn't a, a victory. Um, Maxime Castellet in the 200 wins that category. TSRC 16. Uh, Ippolito Perez in the 49, 9046. Oh, there you go, there's the 904. I knew there was a 904. Uh, Carrera GTS. That's the car that got the podium, or that type of car that got the Porsche's first podium on the uh, Monte Carlo rally. Emmanuel Brigand has won his class despite finishing in the pits. Oh, no, he hasn't. That's just changed. So Pascal Duhamel has just won that category, the GTS 32. Johnny Morland wins in his car. Enrique in the 1978 machine. Jean Perlet, he wins his class. In fact, the top four were all winners in class. So the Dumari car and the Gunat cars, both winning, or all four of those, winning their class. That another one of our uh, support races as such. Uh, it sounds a little dismissive, but that's how the organisers describe it. It, uh, it means, Peter, that they don't form the main part of the weekend where we have the three runs for each of the other plateaus. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, not putting it down at all, but yeah. we've, we've had excitement and all sorts and rain mm. and cars spinning and you say nothing, no carnage, thank goodness, and certainly anybody hurt. But, we haven't even got to the main event yet of the, the you know, the, the Mont. That's a very good point. Yeah, we haven't yep. got to that. We've got support. and we've got another sport race coming up uh, shortly, which is going to be uh, again. We're going to another trip down memory lane for us, John. Group C cars. Now that to me was a, a golden 
golden era of, of Le Mans and sports car racing in general. A fuel formula, as it was. Um, Which people forget. Exactly. It's one, one, thing, it's one of the key things. It should be Group C, a fuel formula, is what it should, people should say. A formula, that's what it was, fuel, I think a fuel series. It's very funny when people say to me, oh, BOP, I hate BOP, oh. it's ruining racing. But if we could only go back to Group C eras. Group C was when it, when it was natural. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. couldn't drive flat out. Yeah. Could not drive flat out. It was extraordinary. Never mind, never mind regulations and part Fermi and ride heights and things like that afterwards and post race tech. If it uh, if it if you didn't have enough fuel in the car, it ran out and you just simply didn't get there. Uh, that, that's just how it was. You had to drive it a certain way. It reminds me of the the old story of uh, uh, Colin Chapman of Lotus Cars when the first Lotus Cortinas were built. And my father was always absolutely pedantic yeah. about this. There was a Ford Lotus Cortina and a Ford Cortina Lotus, as far as he was concerned. And that he wasn't wrong because the Lotus Cortinas were built at Lotus, yeah. supplied by the, the, the donor shell was supplied by Ford, and they were finished there. The Mark II shaped Cortina, which is the way around. Yes, yeah, so I had one of those. But, yeah. but uh, Chapman used to put only enough pints of fuel in the Lotus Cortina Mark I car yes. that went back to the showrooms to be sold, that basically if the test driver drove it above whatever the speed was he de decreed, it ran it out of fuel, and you were sacked. <laughs> it was as simple as that. So it was, it was a portent in the 60s then to, to, to go into to Group C racing. But of those Group C cars, uh, we had C1 and C2, uh, with the, the, two, the two big categories, um, and a whole myriad of smaller cars, as we said in the C2 categories, you've mentioned earlier, Tigers, Spices, Gordon Spice that raced Capris yep. for such a long time. Uh, uh, he never was sponsored by Old Spice, though, was he? Should have been. Never was. No. no. Um, what was it? What was his main sponsor? The Gordon Spice because they were always red, weren't they? Um, it'll come back to us. Yeah, we'll come back, come to, back us. to us. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, went on to build an extraordinary, efficient little cars. Uh, and, and again, we mentioned that Toyota GT1 earlier. That's a bit of a Formula One car. We we had it in Group C cars at the time where you had an aluminium tub, a very simple basic design, some some top drivers, some top designers uh, in those days, uh, Ross Braun, etc., building some of the best designs, some of the best cars. Yeah. But take a stock engine, even a DFV, okay, slightly different version for Le Mans, maybe a DFL, uh, and come and do international sport cars. And of course, then it did IMSA, and you could put Chevy in it. Yeah. So put a local, local engine in it. I think one of the great things about this upcoming Group C race is we've got to see silk-cut Jaguars, and people just love to see them racing in various different... Um, obviously, the car evolved, had three different engines, Jaguars, back in the, the 90s, or well, well, starting with the late 80s, and started off with a magnificent V12 engine, and then had what was a V6 engine, what was sort of yes. a metro engine, um, and then finished up with a Cosworth eight Formula One engine, it basically. Yeah, when you, when you say a metro engine, of course, the, the, the 6R4, the Randy cars, yeah. are close to your heart as well, but you know, a, a little V6, which was effectively yeah. half, half, a, half a V12 cut down with, yeah. with a well, blanking plate on it. I, I, I exaggerate for clarity, but not by Mark. No, it was designed yeah. by a wonderful bloke called David Ward, actually. Yeah. Ah. And, and put a. You know, t take, we, we talked about the Group 5 cars and you know, the 935s we've just seen racing being so exaggerated and so um, so you know, big arched and winged and winged over. Take, take a Metro, which was a UK city car, yeah. and put half of a Jaguar V12 engine in the back. In the back note, not in the front. And make it a mid-engine rally car. It's never going to work. It never, a Metro is never going to work as a rally car. But we had a history of that because the Austin Healey should never have oh. worked as a rally car. It's far a road car. You took all the exhaust system off it all the time. A rally car, how did it work? But we did it. So Porsche's wrapping up there. Um, I actually saw the debut of the 6R4. It ran as a double or course car on a um, rally up in Northumberland on the same rally. An RS200 ran as a triple or uh, course car. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> I, I love. I can it. see the look in your eye there, John. How, you, how your tone lowered. Like, it was quite extraordinary. <laughs> I can it, see you recording. Not quite sure how to explain that one. Because we were running a stage, uh, we got to see them run at a place called Albemarle Barracks, which was um, not open to the public. It was using the runways. It was actually a cruise missile base, and therefore you couldn't get in. But for some reason, we were allowed to use the runways and the peri tracks. 
and it was never how quick the cars went um, in terms of, of the cars at that time because we had people um, out there in V8 engined Opel Mantas, which was an ex Himalayan rally car. It was an ex Sheikh Amita um, uh, Himalayan rally car that one of the guys was running up there. And they, and they, it wasn't how quick they went, it was how well they stopped. I remember there was a tyre wall chicane there, and watching the 6R4 and the 200 stop because you thought, oh, hello, he's got that, that's going to scatter the tyres. And no, they stopped brilliantly. Out on the circuit now, some fast laps by some more contemporary machinery. Uh, we have the Porsche Experience Centre here, of course, at Le Mans. The BMW's already peeling off. Uh, Porsche with, I think, seven experience centres around the world now that the, uh, the one in China has opened. Uh, the original at Silverstone in the centre of the UK which was the model, uh, two in the United States now, one just outside LA at Carson, and one at Porsche US, Porsche North America headquarters, just off the end of the runway at Atlanta. And that uh, is also the uh, heritage center for the United States of America. So we move next on to Group C. Right up your alley, Andrew. Certainly, we talked about the Silk Cut Jaguars, but we're going to see them racing, of course, against Porsche 962s. I think there's a dozen of them in this upcoming race, so that should be fun. There's a couple of very fast Nissans. The IMSA ones, the American-built ones, they're going to be in the show as well. So I think we saw a great opening race, didn't we? But I think we're going to see an absolutely cracking Group C race coming on now. So last year here in this Group C race, it was a Jaguar 1-2-3 with Minshaw winning from uh, Donsenberg and Pete mentioned it earlier, um, Olivier Gallant. So I wonder if we'll have a Jaguar repeat or 1-2-3 or we're we going to see something different. Interestingly, on the entry list is a well-known IndyCar driver, oh. Dominic Dobson, oh, who yeah. started in seven Indy 500s. Um, the best ever was third in a Milwaukee 500 um, back in 94. He's driving for Pac West. But in 1989, um, Dobson uh, drove with uh, Will Hoy and Sean Alasey here for Vern Schupen. And these days he services Porsches in the Seattle area. So um, it'll be interesting to see how Dobson get on. Just John was saying that um, he did race here once in a 962. Um, in a Vern Schupen car, mm. together with Will, late Will Hoy and the other driver was John Alasey, no less. So, we'll see how he gets on. David Hart's got a pretty quick Lola T92. We've seen David racing already. And we got two of the um, Peugeot 905s uh, racing. Dominic uh, Gunnar, who we just saw in this last race, he will be in one of the uh, uh, later 80, 93 cars and Eric Maris will be in, in the, the other one. So, uh, 905s, which of course did win here back in period. Oh, it's about 30 years ago now, unbelievable. Group C, the uh, Johnny seeing the original version of Range Anxiety. <laughs> very good. Uh, very like, clever, very clever. Very good, Johnny. Uh, and hello to Mark O'Baron Swart. Waking up to the sound of the dome this morning, passing by was quite satisfying. I bet it was. We've just had the Porsche race and it looked absolutely superb in what is effectively dry conditions now for the 80 or so Porsches out there. It was not plain sailing, but uh, a, a lovely variety of mostly 911s. And one or two people expressing a disappointment that there were no front-engine cars. We had <laughs> rear-engine and mid-engine cars, but no front-engine cars. There are, I have seen them, and there will be cars out. There's a couple of um, uh, 944 uh, Carrera GTs that I saw out there. Um, I'm not sure that there's any 928s, 928s running. No, I don't think I've seen any. Obviously, we're going to have lots more Porsches racing uh, through the... Uh rest of the weekend. But 
this was a dedicated race for these machines and uh, obviously the stars of the shows were the 935s. But uh, this was a bit of a trip into the gravel, which uh, cost him dearly. Uh, Andre just mentioning there the Whittington World Atlanta 935, yep. which was in second place when it went off at the Dunlop chicane. The sound of the flat six. Well, anybody who wasn't awake at that time will have done. Not all plain sailing, as I said, we did have a problem for one of the two litre cars. It looked like everybody had blown the pit stops, to be honest. So I'm, I'm impressed that that, yeah. uh, that that timing screen has remained uh, the same as we transition into the next group. And Still, we have not yet had one of our plateaus that comes up before too long in the afternoon session. Yeah, we're certainly going to be spinning the clock back when we see those cars from, well, the very dawning of Le Mans, of course, in 1923. They've uh, got terrific, from all through these plateaus, huge entries, 60 or 70 cars. So, ultimately a victory there for Keep Europe. And uh, pretty sure the car which is on pole position for the next race also run by the same organisation. A couple of just those of you who are watching the Le Mans legends, yeah. we speculated about um, Francois Perotto. Not only did he have the first two cars, he also owns the Harrods McLaren as well. Oh, does he? Oh, nice. Um, now, I've got to ask you... got to ask you this question, John. In just a moment. You see a Sauber Mercedes in the background. Classic 2023 Ultimate Prototypes Group C Racing, 40 minutes on the clock. If you're just joining us, welcome along. Whether you're listening in on RS1, part of the Radio Show Limited Network of Channels, or you're watching in glorious Technicolor, the sound and vision perfectly synced together as they come around to start a formation lap of the eight and a half mile circuit. It is the full Le Mans circuit. It's used only twice every three years. We've got a bit of an anomaly this year, of course, with the, the fact that we had a classic Le Mans uh, just last year, but the ACO and Patrick Peter working together for the anniversary of the first running of Le Mans 24 which uh, was in 1923, so it is 100 years that we are commemorating and celebrating, rightly so, as well. Uh, already a spinner, now that's a classic livery that I remember yep. from my early days here. The hydro aluminium. aluminium. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the car's coming around behind our BMW safety car with the lights out, so we will go green this time around. It's a 962C. Uh, Ralph Kellen is involved in that one uh, with the number yeah. seven. And even Vecutere, I think, owns two of these cars, and he really is hedging his German-Anglo bets because he's going to be driving the Porsche 962 and the Jaguar XJR12. He's got two different co-drivers, so in the XJR12, he's got Alex Muller, but in the uh, Porsche 962, he's got Ralph Kellner's, who obviously raced here in period for lots of factory teams, uh, including Toyota. I haven't seen uh, Ralph in the near, Joey. Uh, Joey, we, we, yeah, Joey, yeah. yeah. Joey, yeah. Um, for reasons we won't go into. We won't go into. The quality at the front of this field, I think this is this is my sort of era. Yeah. My first Le Mans. Um, was 89. You predate me by quite some time, Andrew. Yes, well, I'm quite a bit older than you. And I came here very, very early in my life. 
Uh, Mr. John. Oh, okay, another so Ron so Ayla Yari, another Formula 3000 champion. Yeah, and a Macau Grand Prix winner too in Formula 3. A couple of cars just dropped out. I prefer the old multicolored silk cut logo to the all purple. All purple, one. right. Yeah. So, 80, 89 was my first year, yeah. so the that was the Sauber. Yeah. yeah, we've got a Sauber in this race. Yes, There's that hydro aluminium car being pushed back. Where was that? What part of the track was oh, that? No, I didn't notice John. Um, um, so let's run through. We'll get the grid graphic up for those of you watching in a moment. We'll run through it for you. Um, again, an outstanding grid. This is our smallest grid of the weekend in terms of the cars. 30. 30, yeah. Um, and 30 cars that every single one of them has some interest to them. Yeah. A couple that you may not have heard uh, about before, the Olmas GLT 200 from 1988, that's the 181 car, that's a C2 car. Yeah. So for those of you that are a bit younger, think 675 or LMP2, yeah. when LMP2 was an open category, um, that was it, C2 was the... Um, the junior, the junior can be yeah, yeah. very well put on. Uh, there's also the Slamo, which is another new one on me. S T H E M O. What a strange name for a racing car. Here's the Rondo going again. Look, the number 24 machine. That's the Otis Lifts car. We've also got an Argo GM19. That's a yeah. another C2. That was designed car. by a, guy, a Swiss guy called Joe Marquardt, but in the UK. Um. Far fewer classes uh, in this one. I think we've only got five classes. Yeah, only five. Uh, actually, it might only be four. Four classes, yeah. What some great cars. The 905 Evo uh, from 1992. Evo 1 Bis, actually. Yeah, Eric B. Maris is out, and that's a big old thing. Yeah. Oh, they, OK, the Otis car has been pushed behind the barrier. So we will get a start this time around again a rolling start front row then 962 number seven in the blaupunkt so colors the couturier is going to drop drive both cars we don't know which one he's starting yet right um, it might pop up our timing screens but um oh, this takes i don't know john john minshaw and his regular driver phil keen is sharing the xjr12 xjr9 formerly the stick yeah, they're all going to have to to watch the uh, pit window again because for two previous races people have been caught out right so the 24 blue bought this car stopped out of Tert rouge uh, oh. so it didn't get very far round at all there martian sports is Tert rouge so that uh, is behind. It's in one of the cutouts, so it's not going to be a problem. No, it was it was well out of the way. By the way, Phil King being the stick wasn't a big stretch, really, because Phil's a very quiet spoken lad. Yeah. He lets his drive and do his talking. However, when I get the chance to sit down with Keeney, and quite often I do, see him in Dubai for yeah. various things, and we're there for the 24, it's always worth spending half an hour in Phil's company because he is a font of knowledge and very sensible. Yeah. as well and he'll be quick here very quick all right porsche jaguar porsche jaguar jaguar porsche jaguar porsche peugeot lola t92 the david hart car so watch for that the mainly white number seven is the paul sitting car with the number 20 on the inside yeah. in the classic silk cut colors the shorter tail of the xgr9 from 1988 we come to the line 40 minutes on the clock and we are Racing at Le Mans for the Group C's. Bringing back all those memories, flooding, you know, these races. Five across the go. track. Ah. Now, coming through from the middle of the field, the XGR 12 made a good start, as did the XGR 14 of Christoph Donselberg. That's the much lower slung car with the huge rear wing. Very Peugeot 905, actually, that rear wing. That's another phenomenal machine. That's the all purple silk cut car. Yep. Just behind that, here's the battle going on down the inside. Yep. That's the number four of David Hart in that Lola. I thought he'd be quick. The white car with the yellow on the front of it. Now tucking in behind the 17, which is the Christoph Donsenberg, the XGR 14 
What a concept that was, Andrew. Look at how... Well, that, I mean, that looks oh. contemporary, doesn't it? Yeah. It really does. Oh, he had a bit of a go down the inside, was pushed towards a barrier, wasn't he? The... There's a Sauber coming out of the slipstream there. Silva, number 31, with the yeah. yellow numbers. That, the, the yellow um, wing mirrors, that was the 60... Two car. Yeah, in. That, that's a Greek driver, Chris on uh, Len Dudis. Uh, races a lot. Oh, and Peugeot's gone straight on. That's the Evo. That's Eric Maris. He's gone straight on. And, and, a, and the Mercedes spun off. Ah. It was on the outside of the track, sideways. Jacques Lecomte down Jacques in Lecomte. the pit lane, getting ready for something later on. At the front well. of the field, the Seven Porsche is running now. They've yeah. just lapped, I think, the 88 car. Oh, no, that was all right. So, no, no. Ivan is driving yeah. both cars at the moment, okay. so I, he's not able to do that. Minshaw has, has pushed through to or Phil Keenan, we're not sure who's in it at the moment, pushed through to third, but uh, oh, it's hard. So, I don't know. Well, it's, top four I know, I know, now that now we got the one of the, the two Halusa brothers. Here comes the in Lola. The, 16, yeah. the, white, Lola. the white car with the yellow on the front, the number four, into Indianapolis and Arnage. And going up to third place for David Hart in that T92-10. They had Japanese sponsorship in period, didn't they? And that's what's on the front of the car. And he's going for second, and he may have second. He has got second yeah, before they really get fly. to the Porsche curves. And he's coming up on the Blaupunkt leader. The white car with the blue wings and the orange on the nose cone goes for the lead, goes to the right-hand side. That is a super start. Started down on rule three or four and is already through to the lead. Paul Sitter still in second, round the outside. That was a big move down the inside, but that's not going to work. Lars Eric Nielsen in the 962, the fat turbo car, right up there as well with the red stripes. He's up in the third. So he's had a good car, a good start. And once again, three across the track as they're heading back towards the start-finish line. But the leader, my goodness me, he's pulled away. He's pulled away by two and a half seconds. Here's the fat turbo car coming down the inside again. Lost a couple of positions. I thought he was up to fourth for a moment, but I think the Jags fall back. These cars all have slightly different eras. The leading car from 1992, the Porsche in second from 1990, 1988, the Jaguar in third, the XGR9. Actually, it's not the Jaguar XGR9 now because it's the 14 that's well, gone through. Position to change on the track. Terrific battle, isn't it, John? Look at this. Down towards Some cut Jaguar side by side. Down towards the Ford, the Ford chicane. And again, the Porsche very good on the brakes, but does not seem to want to pick up through the middle of the corner, side by side with the Silco Jaguar of James Thorpe. And now out onto the start finish straight. And that was the first flying lap. And the lead is seven seconds for David Hart over Christoph Danselberg's XGR 14, the very low slung all purple machine with the huge rear wing. Looks like you could hang your clothes off it. Not dissimilar to the 962C behind it. Look at the similarity in the aerodynamics, particularly on the rear wing of the second and third place car. Then you go to, in fourth place, the 1989 car yeah. with a much more, in some ways, elegant rear wing. Oh, it's raining. And it's raining at the oh, Forest dear. S's. It's raining at the Forest S's, but look at the difference. This much smaller wing of that earlier Jaguar. Behind that, the white Porsche is Lars Eric Nielsen in the number 90. But just at the back of the group, the red car, Carl Mika, in that spice. Uh, Carl, Canadian, races mainly in the, in the USA. And he's the only good run. Sean Lynn is who... And... Oh, is there uh, a problem uh, yeah, with the number two? I think yeah, there's a tyre no, going down. It's definitely a tyre going down. Or, or something catching? Or was well, that... Maybe. Was that... There was a puff of smoke, wasn't it? I didn't like the look of that at all from James Thorpe in the Jaguar XGR9, the number two car, going into the Daytona chicane. There was markings on the other side of the car, John. I think he'd been rubbing against somebody. Interesting, this Lola was in period raced by a Dutch team. But for second. Side by side Porsche here. Jaguar going down into the second chicane and the fat turbo car 
goes through the 1989 machine. machine. That's the oh, they go wide, though. off the track on the exit. Transitions back on. And the XGR 14, oh, XGR 14 has got missing. Because it's another Porsche that goes through. So Christoph Dansenberg. Oh, what has gone on there? There he is in front of the machine. And wet weather tyres being prepared in the pit lane. Hopefully they'll come into the window and be able to change them then. Race control now saying it is a wet track, so that it doesn't mean it's wet all over, but what that does mean is it frees the tactics to allow the teams and drivers to use wet weather tyres should they so desire. The Blaupunkt Porsche, the number seven car, off on the side of the track there in battling with Lars Eric Nielsen. Do you know what I think it might have been from the side of that number two car? Go on. Spray. It, I think yeah, it was spray. Yeah in the first part of the run down from yep. Turk Rouge to the Daytona Chicane. Could well have been. The weather's completely changed direction from this morning, though, Andrew. It started yep. getting wet from Mulzahn and Arnage yep. in yep. the southern end, and working upwards. Now it's coming in from the eastern side of the track at Turk Rouge. Extraordinary. So, we're not sure if it's David or Oliver father or son in the low light. I expect we'll be able to pick that up at the pit stop. But we've still got these two 962s. Just terrific stuff. Into the Porsche curves, that is. The big, almost integral wow. side fins on that. Uh, the Now, that's the sister car, the car that didn't start that's coming yeah. to the pits, the number 25, which stubbornly refuses to show on my timing and scoring, actually. Um, the 98 car there. That's the Rondo, isn't it? Yes, yes. it is. Oh, that, oh. There was, there were Both, two of them. Two, another, yeah. One which didn't, I don't think, made the start. We've not seen either. Unfortunately, the the March 85G that we were expecting, or the Nissan, the MPT 90. No, that's a big. There was meant to be two of those in this race. That's yeah. a big disappointment. I was looking forward and, to seeing uh, that. Uh, yeah, Carl Tilly was meant to be in one. He was telling me yesterday it was going fine. So, oh, Judd engine, Judd engine in this uh, Lola T9 9210. Nick, uh, Nick Holland. Hello, Nick. We have rain at Dunlop this lap. He ah. says, and I think we saw that uh, in the attitude of the car in the pit lane. Uh, so the we've got the 88 XGR. 12 showing a stopped on the circuit. That was the Vakutra and Alex Muller car. So that car hasn't made it round. Pits for the 98 Spice, the 25 Blue Rondo we've seen in the pit lane. So I think that was the SE 90C with the bodywork off the Dobrebri car. We've had our oh, first. It's really hard now. Yeah, it is. Had, just before the rain started coming down, we had our first sub four minute lap. Spinner. A couple of moments ago, yeah. up at Dunlop, it was the number 11 Porsche, yeah. the Nicolas Death uh, 3 962 from 1990. Rothman's Porsche versus C2. It's the. Tiger or Tiger? Tiger, definitely Tiger. See, I always say Tiger. Yeah, well, I've asked Tim Schenken and I've asked Houghton Yardley. The two founders, because the name is made up for their business, and it's definitely Tiger. Yeah. So the blue number 11 Porsche, Ross of the Prima car, still running. He's got the Rothmans car behind him. I think that's gone straight on. I think the 11 think that just spun yeah, went straight yeah. on there. This is the classic 962 we're talking about. Further up the field. Second place, Christoph Donsonberg is now eight seconds behind the Lola T92, but he's got the uh, Fat Turbo Porsche 962 behind him by just half a second, and about another second and a half further back is the next car in line. Yeah, Fat Turbo were a, a trucking company, yes, Italian correct. trucking company. It's yeah. a strange name, but that's what they were. Classic livery for many years. That there is a team FAT at the moment, nothing to do with that. No. We've seen them racing... Actually, they do race Porsche Cup cars, don't they, in Kravetnik. Um, 
but not the same concern coming out of Indianapolis, down towards Arnage. Was there a little look to the outside there by the first of the Porsches? Lola, Jaguar, Porsche, Porsche, your top four. That's... Uh, so, two brothers sharing the uh, Halusa car. The, uh, the one we see in our picture now, the fat, uh, fat turbo car. Um, their father founded the uh, Apex Partners Company, who uh, fund companies all around the world, venture capitalists. Tiger into the pit lane is the 129, the Long Long Perrier Champagne sponsored machine. And that's a 1988 uh, Tiger GC288. Do you think if we say Lauren Perrier enough, they might get the hint? Uh, do you think they were paid in bottles of champagne for the sponsor? I'd, I'd probably take were, it. yeah. I'd take, a, I'd take an LP deal. Very nice. In, uh, well, the window's not open yet, is it? So. No, this is a problem. Is a it was coasting in. Yeah. Uh, bright red with uh, blue underneath. Very simple but elegant shape, the Tiger in C2. Often looked slightly out of proportion because the windscreen dimensions were pretty much the same as the C1, but they used much um, smaller wheels, of course. Smaller diameter wheels than the C1. Yeah, ones. that's all part of the smaller engines. Yeah. yeah. It was just a scaled down version of the C car. But this Lola is going so well I mean, in period, it was pretty troublesome. Of course, Oiser drove it quite a bit. It is such a good-looking car, though. Yeah. Very similar in yeah. side profile to the XGR14, but predates it by nine years. So the uh, Hart family car, the Hart's from Rotterdam, been racing a long time now, always very so enthusiastic, David, and his, his son, Olivier. So that one, the, the, uh, here's the first of the pit stops, then. Yeah. Well, I suppose, is it because it's a wet track that you can come in anyway? Well, that, yeah, this yeah. is the Minshaw Keane car that's yeah. coming in, the XGR9. I wonder if they're going to go to wet yeah. here with half an hour to go. Yeah, that's the car that won last year. So, the Lola still in the lead by some five and a half seconds. From uh, Dansenberg, the Halusa car, I think it's Lucas at the wheel at the moment. Then Nielsen, and then Mika has brought his C2 Spice. He brought his Spice, not the C2 version, his Spice. The big Chevy in the back, all the way up to uh, fifth place. Change for second position there as on the wetter part of the circuit. It's going to be side by side again. Those the 14 goes oh. actually off the track there. And that's dangerous because there's all kinds of rubbish out there. That is not part of the racing circuit. As the Jaguar goes back into second position, weaving around as well, and the braking area coming into the Mutsan corner. John, I don't know if the loader made a mistake, but they've closed up, took a uh, second and a half off of that last lap. I think it's just so wet. Yeah. The leader is now in sight from the second place battle. So for a moment we had the Porsche in the second. And now, oh, there's, I think there's a problem for the Lola. I do think there's a problem for the Lola. Was okay in sector one, but was three seconds off the pace in sector two. Is it just the wet track has put a lap on the Rondo? And the uh, track surface flags are out. And this, this is not looking good for the hearts at the front of the field. 25 minutes to go. Dansenberg's ready to pounce, isn't he? In the Probably. XGR 14, obviously feeling very, very comfort comfortable there. We did have the Porsche in the second for a moment. That would have been a Yost car back in its day, wouldn't it? I the, think so, yeah. The fat car, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, a big I'm, slide for oh, the... How did he hold that? This. Lars Eric <laughs> Nelson. In the 1990 machine, somehow held on to that number 90 car as the Lola pulls out again now. Yeah, now it's going fine again. Well, I, I just I think, think it's it was it's easy. Just finding a grip, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a problem at Marshall Post 25, which I think is going through Indianapolis. Yes, it is. Into the um, pit lane for the, the number spice. 40 spice. I think that's the car that. Um, Desiree Wilson, Kathy Muller drove in period. Oh. No. 
So Pass the pitch again. No stop this time. So through the forge you came. You're going to have a slow zone. Oh, at change for second place. It's Porsche. And through's gone the number 16, the Halusa car, the yep. 962, 962, the white and red stripe with the green on it. So this is really, this is really interesting to see how a different parts of the track, Andrew. It's dry cars. here, isn't it? It's absolutely dry over the start-finish line. It was raining at Dunlop last time around, so they'll know that and be taking it easy. Huge moment for the number 90, Lars Eric Nelson. But he's managed he's to hold He's really pushing, it. isn't he? So he's obviously yeah. feeling good. And he's gone by. So that's a new third position underneath the Dunlop Bridge for the Porsche. I think, I think he's Christina Nilsson's dad, isn't he? Yes, yes. Yeah. So he, it's no spring chicken, it's going very... Oh, dear, And no, that was smoking. the problem. The Chevrolet yeah. engine's gone in the biggest yeah. possible way down at Arnage. Uh, so and Carl Meeker's car, yeah. Yeah. And that bright red machine with very black smoke coming out of it. So the slow zone has now been put in from the exit of Mulsanne Corner. So that was the, that'll be the 32 car, isn't it? Yeah, the, the uh, got, Spice SE90. We've got one of the two Peugeots in the pits. Which one is that? That is the number three car, the Maris car, out of fifth in class. Yeah, strange enough, last year in this race, he finished fifth. And I'm afraid the That's a long that LP car that we Tiger. saw in early for the Tiger Egg. hasn't got too far. That car, that was on its outlap after an unscheduled pit stop and hasn't got too much further. Now, the, it's 10 seconds between the chasing Porsches and the Lola T92. Yeah. So that's, oh. the, number to, that's the number to remember. The re in fact, there's a change for second, isn't there? Because the yeah. 90's gone through. So, in the second, Lars Eric Nilsson's gone ahead of the Halusa car. Has he? No, no, no he hasn't. No, there's Halusa car, Halusa the car. Okay. there's Lars Eric. Sorry, it was the uh, Jaguar I could uh, say then behind. we got Downsenberg, who's dropped back to fourth as we've... Uh, what is with that on. silk cut there? The silk cut Jaguar? Be, the, the XGR 14 is fast, then slow, fast, then slow. Yeah. They're coming into... The leaders are in the slow zone now. And the number four, Lola, the heart and heart machine. Also into the pit lane, another one well, of the C2 two cars. Yeah. That was the, was that the, the 106. 106. Yeah. That's another. That's another Tiger. Tiger, excuse yeah, me. Fabi, not like Teo Fabi, but F A B B Y, as yeah. in Thunderbirds are go Fab. Yeah. So the, oh, everybody's slow, slowed right down here for this. Well, it's the slow yeah, zone. Slow zone. So, so this is all the way from Mulsanne Corner but, to and through Indianapolis, and then it'll be green again at the end of Arnage, out of the right hand at Arnage. Meanwhile, in meanwhile, into that slow zone, the Porsche Halusa car closed up quite a lot. Yeah. The old the old mass GT. GLT 200. I, th I see GLT, I think of Volvo. Uh, <laughs> Volvo 440 GLT or 460 GLT. That was the bright red car in the pit lane. That's from 1988, fifth in class when it pitted. All the way down here, it's uh, all the way down from Mulsan to Indianapolis. And Everybody abiding by that. Haven't seen the Aston Martin EMR1 from 1989 yet. Number 18 car, which was the number it ran at that year's Le Mans. I know that. I have pictures of it. Photographs of uh, it, too. Here's well, the silk, this later Jaguar silk cut car. It's a Formula One Cosmos derived engine. Doesn't make the same sound as those 312s, John. No, no it doesn't. doesn't sound as now, good. who's going to be quickest on the throttle? Green now. And uh, the Jaguar, I think, look. Yeah, gets a better bit of yeah, traction. It's wet tight. there. We know it was wet there before, but there seems to be more grip there. And the Porsche, once it's spooled up, pulls back away to two or three cars. Difference. This is the battle for overall and the what is called C3A. Actually, 
I tell a lie because the uh, third car at the moment, the Lars Eric Nelson number 90 car, is in a uh, different class to the cars ahead of it. So I wonder why that is. Mm. Age, maybe. Must be. Ah, excellent. Uh, the Ikuria Kos car, which for the 178 Think is your, in the pit lane. Your old boss, Ray Mallet, probably raced that here. Yeah, this is the C285. And here are the second and third cars into the pits. And presume the Hart Lola continued. It was, no, uh, the Hart, I think the Hart Lola's in, just seeing it on the screen. Yeah, bo both of the leaders are yeah, in. That, 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 there's the... Hart Lola coming. finding its pit stop. So I wonder if we can see who's getting in and out. No, they're cut away from that. So the Acuria Cos C2 in. Uh, Hen there was Henry and... Uh, what was the post office one called? I've forgotten Henry because oh. it was Ford engines. Yes. And uh, I um, I once conducted Postman Pat and Swift Air. Remember the Swift yes. Air one? Pa yeah. I took Postman Pat to Brand Hatch and he was signing more autographs than the drivers and they weren't happy. <laughs> the lovely David uh, Leslie was one of them. Uh, much missed, particularly uh, in this place. So. I miss his uh, his smile round yeah. here. So, leaders in the pit stop, so a slight cessation of hostilities. The top uh, 15 all in the pit lane. Uh, actually, having gone through Nicholas uh, Dittieren, and therefore he is scored as the leader yeah. in the number 11. Now, that was the car that spun, the blue Porsche 962 that spun and then missed out the Daytona chicane, but he's leading by dint of the fact that he has not stopped. He's just going through the Forest Essence now and heading towards Turp Rouge. Well, it'll all cycle through, won't it? Malcolm Ross has gone through in the number one 962C from 1985. You'll notice there's not much... We're not getting very excited about the pit stops and there's not much urgency. Again, they are all running to a minimum pit stop time. Um, this is to make sure that people aren't running around like lunatics and not fasting seat belts or not getting things sorted out. It's to allow yeah, for plenty of, plenty of time for the guys to do that, that uh, was pit the, stops safely. Seen bit, Charles Folsman, he was the owner of this, this car. Dutchman. And out goes the car that was leading. That was the sound of the... And there goes the Nielsen one. And what about this? It goes past the Jaguar. Dutzenberg car losing out in this pit stop, but he still hasn't left the pits. I didn't see anybody going on the treaded tyres there. No, I'm, um, sure, I'm sure nobody did. They've changed round in the pits. The two Porsches have changed round in the pits. Yep. It's the 16 ahead of the 90 now. Um, or is that how they came in? No, that, I think that's the way they came in. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Uh, moist at Dunlop now is the description I'm getting. Moist. Via RSL underscore studio. That'll get you straight into Andrew. Peter and myself here in the Global Broadcast Centre. We will take an hour's break at the end of this race coverage and be back for the afternoon session, uh, which should will run through to the end yeah. of the first of the Le Mans Classic plateaus. And then we're back again for um, plateau two and three in the evening session. So it looks like we're going to be a little bit later for you this evening. So number two Jaguar. No, so again. you said that again, didn't you? Yeah, it's no, on. You don't it's think on the it's bumps. a bodywork, do you? On the... I, I think it's on the bumps going yeah. down into the Daytona chicane. The number two uh, Jaguar, the Thorpe and Quiff XGR9. The right rear wheel and tyre is fouling the bodywork on yeah. the bumps. That's I, how I, I read it. Yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely certain of that now. I wasn't sure before, and I thought it might have been a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of water spray just being passed by the two Porsches going into the second chicane on the Mulsanne straight now. Effectively, these cars are second, third, and fourth. 
Um, but no to tail. Um, the two car, yes, has stopped. Uh, James Thorpe, uh, oh, no. and Phil, it, it is Phil Quiff that's in that car as yeah. well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they stopped earlier. They stopped a lap before everybody else. And so they did have a little bit of a benefit in terms of being out there and knowing what the conditions are like. So going out of Mulsanne and heading, I have to say, to my favourite part of the Le Mans 24 circuit, that flat-out blast. This is the battle for effective second place that we're talking about now. The fat Porsche uh, FAT. Porsche, I should say, it's not particularly overweight, quite spelt actually. <laughs> Coming into, well, if we're going to have period cars, we have to have period humour as well. Going into Indianapolis, uh, a throw down the inside maybe at Arnage, the right handed. No. Amazing how quickly that's dried up, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people getting picked uh, sideways yeah, on the road. Yeah, all the road jam. a little bit more. Jag uh, going round the outside yeah. here. We. Uh, we assume that the uh, Elusa brothers switched over this stop. So Eric Maris has gone through in the Peugeot and leads the race. But he has, Nick, has, he, he, has he has stopped. But how did he do that? I have no clue is the answer to that question. One pit stop he has on that car. His last lap was 3.55. Which is by far the quickest yeah, lap of the race. Yeah. So whether they change tyres or they change... Is there someone else in with Eric? No. I wouldn't have been to share that car. I think... What did he do last year here? I uh, finished fourth or fifth. So the Lola T92's gone through in second. That was the early leader. That's the Hart car. Uh, and is at 40... Call that 37 seconds. Dieterson and Malcolm Ross, who hadn't pitted, have pitted. James Thorpe's just done the fastest lap of the race in a 3.53. So, the track's drying up. Absolutely, that's, that, that's, that's we the answer. To, yeah. We didn't really get anybody well, going quickly earlier on because we barely had a lap to get the tyres up the temp and it started to rain. I reckon the track's almost at optimum now. Yeah. 23 degrees track temperature, 18 in the air. Oh, Pit window car, has closed. Yeah. The so, car is missing its rear shield, aerodynamic shield. Which car is that? The, the silk cut jack. You know how they don't have the fairing over the rear wheels while it's gone. Ah, on the number two car? Yeah. The XGR9, OK. Yeah. They run with them and without them at certain races. I mean, they might be running without them, but they're certainly not there. So here is Eric Maris in the uh, Peugeot 905. Built to those Group C rules and ran in the uh, and won the Le Mans with the least number of starters, John. Right. And that uh, that would have been 94? Something like that, yeah. Need to check it out. Um, and there was a period when Ecclestone uh, was, was trying to destroy Le Mans, to be frank. There was all sorts of problems with the TV coverage that he was trying to control. It was the worst period for the for this race, but very good job by Peugeot. This car designed by Alain de Cortans, former Alpine racer. Just for those of you here at the circuit, by the way, and I know plenty of you are listening in on RS1 on a bit of data, a reminder that the trams uh, here at Le Mans will be stopping at 9 tonight. So the last pickup from the circuit is 8.15 from the, the terminus outside the east gate over by the stadium. So if you are intending to go back down to town on public transport tonight by order of the Ministry of the Interior, uh, the public transport will be stopping. Here's the Argo, the speedy Argo, yes. speedy air, uh, sort of a forerunner of uh, of quick fit. Yeah, exactly. Well, the French, it the was the great French quick fit. Yeah. I think they're still going. Actually. They are still going, yeah. And that blue Argo looking well. Aston Martin, the number 18.
idea of Leslie Carr from 89 and still wearing actually the black armband on the front left that it acquired after David's yeah. untimely death. Ah. That the Argo sitting in behind that, the blue, red and white, number one, two, four. It's the GM19C, it's the Fumigali car. Very distinctive look to the aero on that car, particularly how the air was channeled uh, around the cockpit of that car. It's the typical of the time chiselled nose, but very cleverly using behind the wheels and the wheel arches to throw the air through the radiators. Leading Porsche, yeah. uh, excuse me, leading Peugeot goes through Turn Rouge. I think this Maris car is, is one of the later 93 cars, isn't it? It, that was a year that it's it, listed as a 92, but it says it? an Evo One bis. So yeah. it, it's it's a bit like Evo One and a half. Because they won the race in 92 and 93. 93 with Bushu, Jeff Brabham, Eric Hellery. But of course, it, the year before it was Mark Blundell, Yannick Dalmas, and um, Derek Warwick. Barry Lidicott and enjoying this. Not sure where you are in the world, Barry. He said, "These are my favourite cars." And I think, I think for people of a certain age, and there will be many uh, of a certain age, that these will be the cars that they'll enjoy the most over the weekend. Look out, look at that. Lola bouncing into that corner. That car is running so stiff. Well, that, and that corner being the Daytona Chicane, which yeah. is where the number two Jaguar was having so much issue. The cars with nowhere near the amount of aerodynamic downforce of today's current cars, seem to be affected by the bumps there. Well, watch it again. In, in a way yeah. that the cars three weeks ago simply were not. So whether that is set up or um, spring rates, but it's it's not just porpoising, it's oscillating up up and down. Absolutely. Two different versions of Kenwood. Kenwood yeah, I saw that, yeah. Coming through the Ford chicane now, the blue and white. Kenwood livery and the, in some ways, more classic red and black livery. And pulling out with the chicane, ah, in back into the pits. Ah, that was the the fat car yeah. that we said had made a second pit stop. And that is I the number 16 car, yeah. has a problem. Yeah. Just got a message on our timing screen, all pit windows under investigation. I think some people were in early, and I think some people were but, in late. But does that mean of, of all the races that have gone so far? I, all not, pit I, I think everybody in this race. Yeah. We started with 30 cars. Uh, we should have had 43. Um, another one of the... Peugeot's didn't start, the Nissan we mentioned, the yeah. Stedmore didn't start. A couple of the Rondos. Neither of the Nissan started, actually. Right. And we have lost the number 32, uh, Kalmika Spice. That yeah, we saw like that. Blown yeah. the engine oh, at yeah. Indianapolis. The Tiger of Vincent Neres uh, stopped as well, the 129. Uh, and the Vercutra XGR12 stopped, I think, yeah. on the first lap of the race. I think so. Well, the Minshaw clean cars had a second stop. The car that won this last year. Mm. Fred Fatian's come back out again in the Rondo. Oh, yeah. The number 25, that's the, the blue car. That's had a couple of pit stops as well. Now, let's try and work out what's going on at the front of the field. Well, Eric Maris has just gone across the line and lead by about 22 seconds. Massive lead. Uh, and then 354 last time around. David Hart about to come through, hasn't come through yet, so that 20 second lead's gone out. Oh, the Aston stop. Ah, uh, the yep. 18 car. No, Snow is not here at the moment, just stepped out for a second. He'd be disappointed with that. That is on the run, I think that's on the run yeah. down to the Daytona Chicane out of Turk Rouge. He's pulled off to driver's right as the camera Pans out, yeah, that looks like game over, I'm afraid, for the yeah. former Yost Racing. What a lineup of drivers yeah. there. Danny Sullivan, Hurley Haywood, Chip Robinson, Chip Robinson yeah. and Henri Pescarolo. Not all at the same time, of course. Scream of a Peugeot, 908, oh, 905 Oh, that's for the uh, abandoned Aston Martin. 
In fact, actually, it's between the chicanes, isn't it, yeah. that that car has come to a halt. It's still got electrical power. The headlamps are still on. Yeah. So the leader goes through. I know it was the first chicane. I should have stuck with my first thing. Apology to your viewer and listener. So just before the braking area and the turning point, double waved yellows there. Two minutes added to two, three, the leader. So that Peugeot oh. is not going to win. 20, two and three. Two is the Jaguar in third place. So that's 20 is much further down. That's, that's not as important. That's the Minshaw XGR9. Uh, 25. OK, that's not in the top. No. That's the Fred Fatian no, Rondo that's had yeah. problems. 106 is the Jack Farby leading car in C2, the Tiger GT286. And the 129, that's further down as well, isn't it? Where's that one? Um, I think that might so, have stopped, actually, so that one's not going to count. So two minutes added to the Peugeot. So, so that's going to put the Lawler back in the lead. It, yeah, absolutely. So, father and son having a great run in this very bouncy Lola. Joe Taylor spotted why um, Go on. the Persia was leading. It pitted a lap earlier than everybody else, and therefore ah. the slow zone to Indianapolis was withdrawn by the time it got there. But however, ah. I suggest that it pitted too early. So that's good but, news. But definitely that penalty for Maris will put him uh, well, way down the field. I'll put Maris in about 20th place, I think. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, because the top... Andrew, the problem is the top 11 um, are, are all in the same category, pretty much. There's, there's the odd interloper there, probably the top 16. Two, min two minutes is going to put him down to... Actually, he might just hold on to the top 10. Yeah. And he's a C3 car, so he'll probably hold on to his leading class, but he's not yeah. going to win the race. Well, C3 we're in the closing stage of this now, aren't we, John? So, looks like we're going to have a win for the Hearts. Great supporters of this meeting, brought three or four different... Race cars here, they're the 17 silk car car. That car's Sadly, in the pits, yeah. and they're peeling off the tape to take the engine cover off yeah. as well. That was the XGR 14. A, a heck of a job, in fairness, to steer under 20 seconds away from the Peugeot. So the Peugeot has gone through to start the final lap, so there will be one more lap for the car that comes through the... Ford Chicken now starting its final eight and a half miles. And it sounds great because ah. look at that V10 Judd pounding away in the back. Built as a customer car, they never had a, a factory car. Hoisman was the main purchaser. Huntington's finest. Yep. And Lola in good hands now with Till Bechtelsheimer, who took it over yeah. about uh, 18 months ago after. Uh, protracted oh. negotiations. The wind tunnel still in operation. Never yeah. stopped working. The technical centre, as it's called. Double yellow still on the run down to the Daytona, the first chicane. Past the old 24 hours restaurant. And that going past there at the moment. No overtaking there because of the Aston that was pulled up to the side of the road, which is still there. Yeah, yeah. So the Rothmans 962, the number one, uh, that is Malcolm Ross's car, and in behind it, which Jag was that, Andrew? Did you notice? No. Um, I don't uh, think they're battling for position. In fact, I'm sure they aren't. You think that's one that's been lapped? I think the Ross's there's, car there's, there's has been go. lapped, yeah. yeah. So there is Maris. And that's right. another Rothman's car. That's just... Uh, uh, that is the, that was the three uh, SO Peugeot actually behind it that's gone through. So that was Eric Maris just lapping that machine. And he probably doesn't know that he's got that penalty, so he's going to have big disappointment when he gets back to the pits. And his lead is down to 12 seconds. 
So this has been a very, very good drive again by the Hearts. Yeah. Uh, the thing is about them, you know, it's a generation apart, but they're both quick. 3.51.5, by the way, for James Thorpe. He's got a penalty as well. The the Ra Ra Ralph Kellen has just really been flying. 3.44 for him in the uh, car owned by Vakuto. That's a night, that is the number seven. That, that's yeah. the black punk car, the white uh, yeah, punk the, the, car. The white with blue. Correct. Yeah. 344. I mean, that's I mean, a decent time. It's 10 seconds time. faster than anybody else. That's a decent time. That is a very decent time. Nowadays, uh, of course, that would. Yeah, uh, moved him up to third now. Yeah, go on, nowadays. I, I uh, think that would put them sort of where the. Just to give you an idea, that's where the NASCAR, the Cup car was. Yeah, landed, yeah. Three weeks ago. So a blast down so. out of Arnage through the left-hander and approaching the entry to the Porsche curve for the car that will see the chequered flag first, but with the penalties will drop down. Mark telling us, who is at the brilliant at Turt Rouge, is his Twitter handle. Group C, the greatest period of racing, my favourite cars, that's why I'm building one. Oh. Matthew Pig says, oh my goodness, Group C. And Chris says, thank you for mentioning David Leslie, who we last lost with da Richard Lloyd in the same accident. I, I, I should have mentioned Richard as well. Yes. Another smashing bloke. And who ran across the Cannon Porsches here? Yes, of course. Of all so successfully. Got on the podium, one not Yeah. David Ingram, who for many years worked for Audi UK and was who were a big supporter of Radio Le Mans, came to Le Mans as the fueler for that car because he was the tallest guy across the line and the the gap at the end is going to be somewhere near nine or ten seconds for eric maris who's gone through a lift at the end actually for the hearts and and canada's flung in another quick lap right at the end there so a win for the lola on corrected time by 11 seconds, even though they slowed down at the end. Kellen is closing in on third position overall, and they are all C3A cars. Yeah. Then the next car through should be, look out for the number two, Silkut Jaguar. That should be the Thorpe XGR9, and that will win its class. Coming out of Forge again now, there goes Kellen is. And they've gone through into second on corrected time. Yeah. So that was important that Kellners was pushing in those last couple of laps. James Thorpe goes through in third, uh, check that, in fourth overall, but wins C1A. Crichton Leonidis, who we've seen in Creventic 24-hour racing, in well, the C11. Yeah. I'm not sure if he finished that race. But he's racing a Peugeot diesel these days, isn't he? Yeah. He's now gone up into third overall because... Ah. James Thorpe also had a penalty, remember, yeah. in that number two car, or at least that number two car had a penalty. Wow. So the, the Sean Lynn XGR9 still to come around in C1A. Let's see where he jumps to with the penalties being applied. So Crichton Leonidas is sauber with the yellow the bright yellow wing mirrors, which was the 1989 winning car, had the bright yellow wing mirrors. Raced in the World Sports Car Championship for makes. Uh, 61 and 62, I think. Then went on to race in the all-Japanese Group C Championship. Great car, simple design. Notice the name on there is uh, Michael Schumacher's name that he was racing in this program. Uh, and raced here at Le Mans yeah. in the Mercedes yeah. Junior program with, come on, stretch your Carl, Carl Venlinger. Very good. But the other one was somebody strange that went on to do truck racing. I can't truck I can't truck I can't. can't, 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 can't. Oh, that's going to kill me. Twitter, please. Uh, uh, so... The top positions having been affected by penalties. Great start to the race. And a beautiful sight, 15 rows of cars. We did not start all the cars. At one stage, we had five abreast across the track. 
And it looked for all the world as though after the first few corners, the Lola T92, the heart and heart driven car, which was by far the quickest car at the start of the race, picking its way through, overtaking in some ways some far more exotic machinery. Yep and got out to a huge lead, thoroughly entertaining in the, the opening lap, battling with the XGR14s, with the 962 and the XGR9s. Because you're going straight on at the first UK first time. Out. I may be corrected on this, but I don't think that car's ever won a race before. Ooh. Unless I, the hearts don't use it very often. So I can't remember it winning a race. Peter Snowden step back into the booth. He's never been away. He's just been quiet. So brilliant stuff there from Group C. We'll go to a break at the end of this race and be back in an hour or so when we will continue with the afternoon session. Thank you for your kind comments at RSL underscore studio. Just waiting for all the results to filter through. Believe it or not, there are still people coming across the line. And... The big turning point in that race, a little splash of rain and the timing of the pit stops, and not everybody got it right. It appeared that the Porsche team, the Eric Marish team, had got it spot on Pleasure. because uh, the Peugeot team, excuse me, and Eric Maris had got it spot on because they sidestepped one of the slow zones and came out after the pit stops, but they were given a minute penalty, as was the number two Jaguar T, which has dropped them way out of contention. Pit stop time always the opportunity to make up some positions and they did it perfectly in terms of how they sidestepped the problem and did see the chequered flag first but with a, a minute of penalty they dropped way out of contention the Lola T92 then wins for the heart second place the number seven that was the Blaupunkt Porsche at 31 seconds and then another 25 seconds further back the Mercedes-Benz C11 in third. I was just waiting for everything to come through, but Sean Lynn's uh, Jaguar is in fifth position and second in the C1 Air class, second to the Mercedes. Then the Porsche 962, number 69. Then Eric Maris in the penalised Peugeot. Lars Eric Nelson in the 90 car. That was the 962 fat turbo car. Then Philip Schema in the 62 CK6 in eighth. Ninth, Tony Sinclair in the Spice. That's a good result yeah. for that car. James Thorpe with the penalty, finishing in the top ten, just in the top ten. Rainer Becker's Porsche 956 won the C1B category. C2A, Marco Fumagalli for the Argo GM 19C from 1988. And the other class winner, Lionel Bosch for the Ecos. The a Curie cost C285 from 1985. And that's it for our morning session. Slightly delayed. We will be back at 2.45 Central European Summertime. Join us here at Le Mans for the Classic then. Bye for now.